Hey, yo, what's good? What's good? What's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ The Road Podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I am one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got DJ Never here. Yo, yo, what up? We got Jamie the Great. Yeah. And now we got a special guest. I don't know how this guest got here. Yeah. It's, we it's, I don't know. Of, we're we're kind of clueless <laughs> on why he's here, why he's even here. But, you know, he's one of the greatest songwriters, producers, remixes of all time. His label, So So Deaf, has produced countless platinum records. I remember we had a conversation with one of his homies, Stone Rock and Graham. Mm -hmm. I think in 2018, we had a conversation on which producers had the longest run of hits. Yeah. And between Dr. Dre, Timbaland, Pharrell, Neptunes, you know, we all voted unanimously Jermaine. for this guest here, Jermaine right Dupree here, in the building. Jermaine yes. Dupree, thank you. So the last time I, I, I saw you was a few times when you were on Scam Artist and you were DJing. Yeah. And then in the 2000s, you were hanging out with Stone Rock. You guys were like running around. I think I was DJing at Tao and you were just like hanging out and you were spending maybe more time in Vegas just wilding out. No, no, I actually had a residency. So yeah. I was here. Uh, I was do Tris and then I leave like, um, I would leave Tris and go to like Stone Rock and they, they was like doing like, I think... Uh, they're at the Palms. The palms, right? right? Yeah. yeah, they'd be at the, like, the, the club at the top of the Palms, and I'd just go over there. Do you remember how you linked up with Stone Rock? Because we even hit him up. He doesn't even remember. Like, exactly. um, I think we was all managed by the same people. Did you just do Suji and yeah, Scam yeah, Artists? Yeah, yeah, so it was a Suji thing, um, and we just, you know, we, I, just supporting each other from yeah. being down with Scam. Did you enjoy that, that era when you were just DJing and... And doing the clubs because you were like really into it. Yeah, you were, yeah. Like, you were I mean, you know, yeah, because I started DJing before I started producing, so it's like you know, it's like almost like a, uh, like a, uh, what you like Michael Jordan playing baseball. It's like something that you like you wanted to do, mm -hmm. but I was just like, I never really, you know, went after it or ever like even like paid that much attention to it after I started producing. I was just like. Okay, that was just like something that I love doing. What what planted the seed to get you like kind of going back into the clubs and signing with and working with uh like Suji that scam artist and Um well I came to Vegas and I saw Tommy Lee and I was going I was going down the strip. Tommy Lee Anderson's town Tommy Lee. Yeah, I was going down the strip and I saw live DJ Tommy Lee and Was I'm this like, at light? And I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, he DJs. And then I start like looking at him like, oh wow, they paying him a shitload of money. <laughs> how, is he, how, how is he a DJ? Was the um, Bilbo was that light? I don't even remember where it was at. It was just like because I DJ him one time. And he got kicked out. He got kicked off. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying, listen, this was before. This was before. It was no open format DJs in Vegas. You know, um, this was a time when hip hop wasn't even here. Dre's wasn't even. Popping. So you know, Dre's what, wasn't even I, open, by the matter of fact, what I'm talking about. And Excess, they didn't have a DJ booth. The DJ booth was in the back corner. It was like a closet. Yeah, this, yeah. Was, this was pre-EDM everything. I was yeah. out here and I saw this and I was like, wait a minute. If y'all going to pay Tommy Lee to DJ, <laughs> I can DJ and I can at least bring people to the club. <laughs> so then I just did it like a joke. Like, yo, let me see if uh, somebody give me a gig to DJ in <laughs> So that's, and that, the first one that happened, um, I started DJing at Planet Hollywood at the club that was up. Privé. Yeah. Privé. I think yeah. I opened for you that night. Yeah, yeah, I started DJing there, and the shit was packed. It was popping, and I started falling in love with it. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm going to keep doing it. I wanted to stay at Privé, mm -hmm. but something happened with the club, and it moved, and it was like, next club. And then we got, I think I got another club. Um, I forget what club that was And then it just You know I just kept moving From club to club And then finally I got a residency A real residency At, at Tris And then after a while You just stopped Right Yeah I stopped I stopped Going into like COVID Cause when COVID happened The clubs changed to me Like you know um, The fun of the club changed The format um, mm -hmm. And then you know I feel like I also feel like Vegas changed A lot Um Musically, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. when when Dre's came and they Dre started taking all of the hip hop artists and was performing at Dre's, it did, it made people not really come want to come out here and just listen to a DJ play the music because if you have an option to go see Darn. a DJ and somebody performing, then you're gonna go do that. So it was just like a like I just felt like it changed. Like it became like more dependent on performances. And yeah, just it, like I said, it, just, that, yeah. it was just like, and basically probably just because I, like I said, I started doing this. I was the first open format 
celebrity DJ. I believe on on the strip. Easy, bro. We just had, <laughs> yeah, man. We, go go there. Like, yeah, listen. <laughs> we just had Clint Sparks, and he came up here and he said, "Yeah, yeah." Now, see, that's what I'm saying. But Clint Sparks was playing dance music. By the way, I, I saw the Clint Sparks interview. Mm-hmm. I okay. actually, matter of fact, I performed at Clint Sparks' party when he was at the Hard Rock. That's what I'm saying. I know I was. I seen all of that. I'm talking about straight hip hop, open format hip hop, like. Trap, all of that shit. He wasn't playing none of that. I'm from the south. He wasn't playing none of them. Okay. I was playing all of that shit prior to anybody coming out here. See, I believe Jermaine Dupri more than Clint Sparks. Well, at this well, point. well, the thing is, there was a hip hop scene in Vegas that mm-hmm. was like, uh, I guess it was considered the mashup era, but it was like the DJ AM. There was like War and Peace. There was like there was hip hop. It was before it was called open format. It was yeah. more mashup. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Open format. Mm-hmm. I was I didn't know nothing about the mashup. Yeah. I came in as an open format DJ. Mm-hmm. I wasn't playing no EDM. I wasn't playing no house music. I was playing all straight rap, down south shit, and then like you know whatever whatever was popping in hip hop. Um, they actually was trying to tell me to stop playing rap when I came out here. Yeah, because like, you when you came here, it was like the emergence of like the EDM. EDM was just coming, started right? to pick yeah, up. Yeah, I mean EDM. I mean it was fresh. I remember like I used to leave my set and go catch um, um, <clears throat> Diplo. Diplo used to DJ at Privé. Mm-hmm. At the top up there, with, and, and it was like so crazy to see it. Like I go to Planet Hollywood and see, or not Planet Hollywood, the Palms, and go see Diplo DJing. It'd be nobody up there, and then like in the next <laughs> seven months, you couldn't even get into a Diplo show out here. Yeah, because is this around the time you were like linking up with Chucky and you were making like yeah, yeah, songs, yeah, all of that, like, yeah, all of that. Like, that's what I'm saying. All of that, like the Chucky record. Let the beat, I, uh, yeah, let I the actually, bass kick. Yeah. I actually got on that record because a dude that used to work at XS named Brian Nevis, um, he was the one that was pushing for Vegas to get Chucky out here, right? Mm. They, even, they didn't even know who the fuck Chucky was. That's how early this why I was doing this. Wait, so how did you know Chucky? How I met him through Brian. Oh. That's what I'm saying. I, no, I, I didn't know who Chucky was either. That's what I'm saying. He was like, yo, it's this dirty EDM sound. That's it, com- cause coming from over. You know, where it, they from? Um, Dutch. Dutch. That, yeah, it was the that, dirty right? Dutch. Yeah, dirty, dirty Dutch. Right. Dutch, so he yeah. was telling me all about it, and then he played me the he played me the the, um, the record, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'll get, I'll put my voice." Because they was sampling my vocals already, so I was like, "I'll put my vocals on this." So now I put my vocals on the Chucky record. That shit caught on, but it was still like I said, it was so early. Nobody wasn't doing this. Wait, so you just jumped on the record? You just like yo, fuck it. I'll yeah, just- like he he gave me a beat. And I just jumped on it, like, oh, okay, let me let me see what happens. Because I also saw, like, I saw it was people coming to my to my shows that weren't completely into hip hop, right? So mm-hmm. I started trying to play like more records that I felt like was not super hardcore EDM, but still was like in the middle of like kind of like commercial dance yeah, music, yeah, yeah, and like where like um, the Black Eyed Peas were at, like you could play like mm-hmm. stuff like that and get the crowd still going and then get back into yeah, hip hop. Yeah. And then you started like you were on the remix for the the class. I'm the ish. Well, I did that. Like, yeah. I, I was just making remixes just to do it. I mean, at, you were. Yeah, we. I mean, we we really wanted to talk about your remixes. Yeah, yeah I, was I, just I feel doing like it just to do it. Yeah, because you did so many. <laughs> I, I feel like you're the remix king. Yeah, at yeah. this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. no, no, for real. Like, <laughs> no, nah, definitely, man. Yeah, because we were, we were talking about it's almost and it's really hard to find a discography of all your remixes. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not listed. It's hard to find. It's, it's like it's, it doesn't all exist. My music, period. Yeah, there yeah. is. Yeah, it they really just is. tried to do that with like we did Sirius XM, um, the month of Black History Month. I mean, Black Music Month, and it's all social deaf radio. And they was trying to figure out like, do I have a list of all my songs so they could play them? And then when they started trying to pull it up. It's like 10 pages long, and I'm like, I've never even seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> like, a lot of people don't know, you did a lot of the early um, Bad Boy record remixes of, like, all them biggies, totals, yeah. Yeah. total records that came out, but it, you don't, you can't find it online, though. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, the yeah. juicy... The well, juicy I mean, that's that's, yeah. called, that's just vinyls, right? I guess yeah, because of the vinyl, vinyl. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's just vinyl. Yeah. I was like, uh, we wanted to talk about kind of your relationship at the time with... with uh, we wanted to ask about your relationship at the time with Puffy. Yeah, because it was like I remember seeing like I think it was the the brat. It was the give it to me video. Yeah, and it might have been the first time that I saw so many cameos. Yeah, and I was just like, wow, that like these motherfuckers are like really cool with each other. Like yeah. you guys were always hanging out, even on like one more chance remix. You guys just seemed like a big family. Like it just seemed like 
like a family get together, like when you guys linked up. Oh yeah, yeah. In it was the like, music you know, video, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's always been like that. Like, you know, when Big first came out, um, it was me and Brat was on tour with Big and Craig Mack and I think Bone Thugs and Harmony. This was like a chicken circuit um, <laughs> tour, and you know the the hottest two artists at the time was. Brat and, and uh, Craig Mack Biggie hadn't even popped yet Like Juicy was still just like right, yeah. People was trying to get to mm-hmm. Juicy um, And it hadn't popped yet So Big kept You know Big kept watching What was happening with Brat So then he felt like He needed me So Big was pushing for me To do the remixes Because he was like oh, wow. My records ain't getting played I need to get I need to be on the radio So he used to tell me all the time Make me wanna Change my beats And get me on the radio oh, So wow. that was It was, he was him pushing To get me to do the remix wow. How Like what was your relationship With Biggie like That was That, that was, was it. my man Y'all were just like Yeah that was my and man him, like, him and the brat Seemed really, really yeah Him yeah, and nah, the brat we, Seemed like really tight like, Yeah no, nah, we got Really really close I mean you know Him and Brad got close Because they were smoking Weed all the time So, so it's like <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, once he found out he could smoke weed with a girl and she sit there and smoke with him, they was always smoking weed together. But yeah, when we was on tour though, we just got really, really cool. And from my 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 place with Big was just like, like I said, he wanted to be successful. He wanted to be on the radio. And at, like I said, at that time, I think Functify was number one. Mm-hmm. Um, then you know, Flavor and Yale had went number one as well. But at that, when those two records went number one, um, Juicy was just still bubbling. It wasn't like. It wasn't like a huge world success. It was funny when the brat came out. You know, I was in New York. I was fairly young in New York. I was a, I, I loved the brat. So like growing up, I always wondered. I initially thought she was from L.A. because she had such a West Coast look and a West Coast sound. Yeah. And even like looking back, I look at Crisscross. They had a really West Coast sound. And I was like talking with Neva a little bit, and I was like, it was a little. Weird in the beginning, being from New York, he's from the Bronx, I'm from Manhattan, Uptown. It was weird, like, to really figure out the sound and identity of Atlanta at the time. Because I think it was, like, even coming up, like, uh, until Outkast came out, it, it yeah. seemed like all the artists kind of, like, either went e- East Coast or it's West Coast. But there was all this, like, I know at the time, you everyone needed approval from New York and, like, the East Coast kind of for, for all the music. And then yeah, I know. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy because like ultimately, um, what do my records sound like to you? Yeah, well, I think when we had that conversation, right? <laughs> when we had the conversation about like the producers who had the longest run of hits, we one of our arguments for every producer was that they had such a signature sound. Yeah, so, but the signature sound got oversaturated. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then maybe after five or six years, they needed to either reinvent themselves, you know, or they kind of just kind of fell off. Yeah. But with you, it seemed like you really just catered your music to the artist. No, I, yeah, but, you know? but I ask you that question because, like, when you listen yeah. to, like, Money Anything, what does, what does it sound like to you? It sounds like a East Coast record, like a yeah. New York record. Okay. Only well, because Jay Z is on it, rapping. Mm-hmm. So only because Jay Z is on the record, it sounds like an East it Coast record. It makes it, yeah. I'm saying, but yeah. my parts, what does it sound like? It sounds like an East Coast. It sounds okay. like some an East Coast influence. So, so that I mean, I say that to say like that's what Chris, you know. You got to think about like crisscross first. Uh, crisscross was basically just doing what I was. I wrote all of them songs, mm-hmm. and even on Brat first album, I wrote all of them songs basically. So it's like they was just really rapping the way I rap. That's how I actually rap. Like it's not even like a. <laughs> a that's just how I rap, and maybe because I, you know, I grew up around New York rappers. Well, that was my exactly, thing. Is yeah. like, I recently saw an interview with you and Ti. Yeah, and I was like listening to you know Ti sound south as as hell like yeah. they sound country as fuck. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then when I heard your voice, there were certain words and certain phrases that sounded like a New York accent. But I also yeah. came up in an era where you know um, you can't you know I came up in an era where people was calling us super country, and they couldn't understand what we were saying in Atlanta mm. and. All kind of other shit like that where I had to start doing interviews where I could almost like over enunciate words so that people could really, really understand what's going on. Right. So I had I had to do like a lot of moving and bending and cause people just didn't get what was happening in the South. But it also wasn't a thing like prior rappers before T I and um even like before the Goody Mob, I mean uh Outcast, it yeah. wasn't no real like Atlanta sound 
mm-hmm. as far as like rap. That's it was just you know basically like a, um, you know, the, the twang that's in our voice. Yeah. That's probably what you would hear, but it was no like a, a actual style of rap that came from Atlanta. So you were actually like suppressing your accent a little bit. Yeah, because if yeah. I talk to you like how we talk in Atlanta, <laughs> it's not only, you know, people be saying like they can't understand what, you know, I be saying people like, what the hell did he just say? You talk to your friends that live in Atlanta, it sound like patois to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, you know, a lot of, I, I never put that into my raps because like at the same time, I was, like I said, I was, I, w- I come from an era where I was actually trying to break through in the New York world. Right. Um, and I don't have, you know, I have no hold back of even saying that because it wasn't no scene in Atlanta. I actually was the first person to sign the first group to get a major record deal in Atlanta. So mm-hmm. rap, major rap starts with me in Atlanta. Yeah. But there was rappers in Atlanta in the 80s, right? No. There was no rappers? There was like no rap scene in Atlanta? I mean, not major. You know what I mean? You had like, you had, I think everybody in Atlanta was independent besides Shadi. Well, Shadi got signed to Luke Skywalker, which still was independent. So Criss Cross was actually the first rappers from no, Atlanta. Silk Times know? Leather was my first group. I mean, that was your Silk first group, but, Atlanta, but Criss Cross was the first to like really blow up. To have like a number one yeah, yeah, to have to worldwide. be to, to be worldwide, yes, yeah, yeah. Group. Mm-hmm. the first rap group out of Atlanta. To yeah, do that. I got a funny story. Um, actually, I met Silk Times Lover. I used to intern at Kiss FM. Yeah, my first day of interning there, you might have been with them. They came to the studio to promote that album, and like everybody that worked in the studio, they was like. They don't know about the music, but those girls look bad. I got to take a picture with them girls. They, they all look good, man. Right? I don't know what they sound like, but they look good. Right? That's crazy. This is, see, that's what I'm saying. This is what I had to deal with. We was going to do radio interviews, and nobody even listened to the music. They just was looking at the girls. That's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> Never like, give it a problem. That's crazy. That's what I had to deal and everybody with. Everybody was taking a picture with them. It was like, yo, let me take a picture with them. Let me take a picture with that's them. That's crazy. How did, you, how did you produce their first album? That was your first experience producing. Like, how did you just go in the studio and just fuck around with drums? Were you just there and for hours just trying to figure shit out? Um, no, because I had it already. I would, like, make records in my head, and I'd think about, like, every little part of the song completely. I'd actually produce the whole records in my head, and then I'd go to the studio, and I'd tell somebody exactly what I want them to do. And then they'll make, they'll make the beats. Because I wasn't actually programming the beats. I was only 16. Mm, yeah. So I wasn't actually programming the beats. I was, like... Um, so you get like getting your ditty on, kind of your puff tone. Nah, because I was actually programming in my head. I right. tell the person exactly okay. how the beat go. This how the beat goes. You make the beat like you tell the engineer just, how to hook it up. Yeah, whoever had the equipment. I didn't mm-hmm. have no equipment. I was I was broke. I didn't have no money, right? So I didn't have no equipment at my house to like make beats. Um, and then I got I, I made like two hundred dollars, and I got like a drum machine, like a five hundred five. And the 505 didn't have no, it was a rolling 505, it didn't have no sounds, but it had stock sounds. Mm. So then I started making the beats that I had in my head in that little rolling. But I but I knew once I got to the studio, these ain't the sounds I'm going to use. I'm going to change these sounds to make them sound like this snare from this break beat, this kick from this. I had all of this in my head. So I just go to the studio and I give them the beat and I'll make them whatever they was doing to change the sounds. we will do all of that. So... Were you always like listening and breaking down music like that, or were you doing it more? Because there was a, I think in the TI interview you were mentioning something, and I and I was talking with Neva about this. Was that you wanted to sample the Trouble Man um, Marvin Gaye record? Yeah, and I think you were using Otis Redding Studio. Well, no, right? so Otis Redding is one of the people who that was like that's what I'm saying. That um, rest in peace. He just passed mm-hmm. away not too long ago, but he was the guy. That was making the beats for me, right? Or he was he was helping make music for me in this period of time. And if, by the way, if he would have did what I said, right? It would have been the you're saying if he would have did what I said, right. I would have been the first person to ever sample a whole record. You would have never heard nobody do it besides me. When and, I tried to do that, he was like, "We can't do that. We can't take people's music." I'm like, "I don't give a fuck." Like. <laughs> This this what I want to rap over. So when I heard that, I was initially thinking like, nah, that can't be because like, like rap is delight. No, nah, they probably good they, they took good, somebody good beat. times. Yeah, yeah, they took. That's what I'm saying. But I'm but that, saying but you end up as, you end up telling me that was an interpolation, right? Yeah, uh-huh. where they replayed. They the replayed. Yeah, the um, um, Sugar Hill Records had a house band. They used to redo all the um, instead of sampling, they used to just replay the the records. Yeah, so it was all interpolation. Yeah, so I was like, oh shit, JD's right. That yeah. would have been the first sampled song. Would have, yeah, like that would have been happening. <laughs> I mean, 
yeah, uh, the way I wanted to sample it, I'm saying like, you know, the same way I chopped the Criss Cross record, I wanted to chop this this Trouble Man record the same way at that time. Like, I was like, take this part, we're going to take this part, and I was taking, taking the break, and I'm like, we're going to flip this part right here when the rap come. I was showing him everything that I was going to already do when I started. And he was just like, there's no way. You can't there do that. had never been done before. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, especially, he was from Macon, Georgia. Nobody's doing that in Macon, Georgia. Like, it was not even a thought to take somebody's project and his father's old as Redding so they come from a musical background where it's like that's not supposed to happen right mm -hmm. but that was my mindset like me and my my man Chad Chad he, this is all we was thinking about and that's all we had by the way we didn't have no record I mean we didn't have no drum machine we had records so we sitting there dropping the needle on different parts and mm. we like this would wow. be crazy if we rap right here and then we move this part and put it right here like we Basically, was make, producing the record on, with the records. Did, did you ever go back to uh, to see if you could make that record work? Or, nah, nah. Because by the time by the time I got equipment and was able to sample, sampling was like the wild wild west at that right, point. Right, so right, it was right. like fine records that nobody had ever you know sampled. That was one that people was already touching. It was pause. So, oh yeah, <laughs> pause. <laughs> <laughs> in in your work um, with Puff. And around the time of like the East Coast, West Coast beef, you know, Suge was uh, at the Source Awards and I remember he was kind of, it was a classic moment and actually started the East Coast, West Coast beef. He was at the podium and he was saying like all you artists out there, if you don't want a label where the executive producers all in the videos, all in the records dancing, coming to death row, everyone, a majority of everyone thought he was talking about Puff. And then I was talking with Nev and they were like, yo, there were some people that thought they was talking about you, J JD, did you ever think that? Nobody ever thought you saw No? Me. Nobody ever thought you saw me. <laughs> you said, yeah, yeah, we used to argue. There were some people in the East you know Coast that used to this? think that. Listen, you know what's crazy about this yeah. whole story? Yeah. Why? When people always say you thought you were talking to me? Yeah. Because the funny part about this whole story is this. Even when Big and Outcast won, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They almost like s separated Jermaine Dupri and the Brat like we weren't even from the South. Right? Because we performed on that Source Awards. Brat performed. We was in the audience singing so functified and all that. Nobody wasn't saying shit to us. It wasn't that they didn't have nobody thought about me and Brat. Even when, like I said, when 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 Outcast got that award, the whole audience seemed like they was like mad at them. They didn't boo us. They didn't say nothing about we from the South. I'm from the South, right? <laughs> and that's what it is. Nobody said nothing to me. They wouldn't think about us. They didn't. They didn't look at us. Nobody was looking at us when they made that up. That was a situation where it was like. So you knew automatically who he was talking about once he said that. Yeah, because it was like, you know, it's, that's what new, that's what rap was. That's where I come from. It's either like the West Coast or New East York. Or West, that's yeah. what it is. It was never no, you know. And like I said before, Atlanta didn't matter. Like you know, when like when you even when you say like we was trying to like get approval from these two places. Yeah, we had to. Nobody, nobody mattered in between New York and L.A. when I came up. If you came out and you went to New York and you tried to get your record played, you had to go see Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, um, Molly Mar, or one of these guys. I didn't, Mr. Magic. See, no. I, yeah, I didn't even get a chance to see them, but Chuck Chill Out and Red mm -hmm. Alert, mm -hmm. they was like my homies. And they was like, J.D., we ain't playing that South shit. Damn. Really? And I'm like, y'all my guys. And he's like, yeah, it's cool, but we're not playing this shit. <laughs> you know what? Because at a time, New York, <laughs> you couldn't play anything outside of New York. You, it had to be all New York. I mean, it had to be good. So they just made me think like it just wasn't good. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. Like, So the Silk Times Leather Project, that's what I went through the whole time. Like I was trying to get them to play the records. They was like, yo, we love you, little bro. But uh -huh. this shit whack. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. Well, I was wondering, did you, did you get... In like into the whole scene while you was in Brooklyn in New York and you was working with them. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because you you and Chad, Chad and Jermaine, you guys had yeah. the group. You guys were in Brooklyn, yeah. Which is where I initially thought you got like a New York accent or a little bit of a New York swag. I was, I was twelve years old. Yeah, I, yeah. How much older you? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm twelve, thirteen years old. I'm living in Brooklyn. What yeah, do you think that's I'm gonna crazy. Sound like? Nah, I'm gonna start picking up, and I'm and I'm a hip hop junkie, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's even worse because I'm picking up. Anything that happens in hip hop, I'm like Johnny Five, right? I'm reading books. I'm just did, 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 did. I'm, and you was you was around it, man. Like yeah, you was I'm, at the, I'm, yeah, I'm going to parties I ain't guys. supposed to be in. Yeah, 
I'm doing all kind of shit that's like all hip hop. Mm-hmm. If somebody say somebody performing over here, I'm going to the performance, not even thinking about the doorman. Like I don't even think like I can't get in. I'm mm-hmm. thinking about I'm going to the shit. And then I get there and they be like, you can't get in. I have to try to figure out a way to get into the parties. All kind of shit. It, like after the Silk Times Leather, you they like no one was playing your records. Red Alert didn't want to play. Chuck Chill Out. When when you started making records from then moving on, were you like, I gotta make records that can get played in New York? And just like, I gotta hit these markets. If it's not playable in New York, like I Nah, can't I start do it. trying to find I start trying to figure out like a different angle. Mm. Right? That's when I just start thinking like, okay, it's gonna be tough for artists from the South. Cause I kept thinking it was just because we was from the South. You know? I thought it didn't matter how good the music was, it was just based on me being from Atlanta, I wasn't gonna get chosen like he's from Atlanta it's not going we're not fucking with them right so I just start thinking about like what's the angle what's a different angle that I could come to, to at least get heard or get my music heard because like Silk Times Leather they didn't pop but they made enough money for me to start buying equipment mm-hmm. and having enough, like basically enough stuff to start making the records that I needed to make that's also the thing I think too I also think that my records weren't fully all the way that they should have been because I didn't have the access to do what I needed to do. To get the equipment and everything. Yeah. What, what do you think it, it, it started changing like in the 2000s when like obviously New York kind of started falling off and it was all about the South. The South took over and it was like snap music was hitting. Like all of a sudden New York club music kind of phased out. Around that time or even before that time, when you were making music, were you still getting any pushback on the East Coast? Oh, yeah, 100%. Really? Like, yeah. you know, people hate to hear this story, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, my records, Bone Crusher and the Young Bloods Dam, yeah. Yeah. was the turn of New York radio. Mm. Oof. It really was. Listen to their yes. sound effects. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> it really was, You're right. though. You're right, yeah. <laughs> I'm the alley. Yeah, you got to put that in the Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, Nah, so, so listen, so um, at this time I was the president of Arista um, under L.A. Reid, and mm-hmm. I signed, I had left Columbia, and I signed Bone Crusher, and I signed the Young Bloods, right? And I put these two records out, um, Never Scared, and um, Damn. Right. Mm-hmm. And these records became like- Huge in New York. They, but they, everywhere. They everywhere. Crazy, Las everywhere. Vegas. Crazy, everywhere. But I was living in New York at this time, again, right, working at Arista, and it was my, just my goal to destroy the streets of New York. I hired Envy, I was, I hired Sugar J, I had all of these guys that was in the streets, um, working on my street team, um, I think we had, we had everybody, you know what I mean, we had Pecos, we had everybody over there, right, it was just like... It was no way you wasn't gonna hear this, um, and we just destroyed the streets. Like it was just like no way that people could not get these records. And then when I did the Bone Crusher remix with Sizzler, I wasn't even no. I, I was I was still not satisfied with what I was seeing. So I put Buster Rhymes on there, mm. Cam Run, mm-hmm. and I and and Jada Kiss, and I was cause I was so determined. To destroy that 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 <laughs> myth that we can't be on the radio, like this was a goal, and I watched it happen, and I watched like every DJ like what the fuck, we gotta play these records. Yes, you gotta play. It was huge. Right? I remember and, we were, we were running the Never Scared the Sizzler remix. Yeah, and that was the that, that was there everywhere in New York. That was the version we heard, and that's what. And we then heard. it was like one day, um, the street team came back to the office, and it was like. K Slay broke the record. And I'm thinking he broke it like he played it. Shattered. But it's like he broke the record. And he was like, Y'all bring me one more Southern record. I'm going to beat the shit out of <laughs> Damn. And I was like, Whoa. Rest in peace, K Slay. But I was man. like, Yo, at that point, I knew that I had done what I was trying to do. Because I he was frustrated. Because it was like, Oh, this is too much. Like every DJ was playing these records. And then I started doing like, the Gentleman's Club versus Sue's Rendezvous. And I put all the strippers from Atlanta on the bus and took them to New York and did oh, a shit. strip off at in Sue's. Oh, shit. Sue's Damn. Rendezvous? Yeah. Wow. 
That's crazy. Really? Yeah, look at you. Yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> I never really made it to Sue's rendezvous. So yeah. I've heard, I've I've, heard the I've stories. Gone there, I've gone in a couple of times. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I'm talking about I was, I, I, I did all that. I was wow, doing man. all that. Uh, uh, Amber Rose was still dancing in the club when I was. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One of my favorite remixes of all time that I like, I, I just like, you know, for, for me in New York, I just really look in the late 90s, I look forward to the So So Deaf remixes. And, you know, and there was that, your compilation, the So So Deaf Bass All-Stars, mm-hmm. those two volumes, volume one and two. Yeah. I remember, I don't know, I think it was the Freaknik time around, around that era. I could be wrong. Yeah. But I always wondered, because I was in New York, and there wasn't really a clear distinction on what the ATL sound was. So when I would see Freaknik video, all we saw was like Miami bass. Mm-hmm. And then when these two albums came out, I was just like, oh, this is like maybe the ATL sound. Like all this kind of, you know, two-step, double-time Miami bass shit that came out at the time during Freaknik. Was that the soundtrack of the Freaknik? I was like, look, I've talked to many like people from Atlanta. Yeah. And he said, if you want to know about the Freak Nick, you have to talk to JD. Yeah. Because he's the person who actually made it like what it is and what it's known for right now. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> nah, <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to say, yes, listen. The So So Death Bass All Stars yeah. definitely was the soundtrack for Freak Nick. Mm. Uh, but Freak Nick was going on in Atlanta. Yeah, since the early 90s. 80s. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all I did was like, this is my record company. This is a weekend that's happening. It's almost probably like what y'all do here in Vegas. If some weekend happening and it was a record company in the city, they're going to try to do as much shit as possible to be seen because this day city and all of these people coming to town. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would do. I would say like, I tell Lil John, because Lil John was like working at So So Death at this time, right? And I tell all the rest of the street team, listen, we need as much street team promotion as possible. We'll make flyers, we'll make T-shirts, we'll make towels because it's hot. We was making beach balls that said so-so death freak nick. Everything, whatever it had something to do with being outside at this time. Water bottles that said so-so death. We knew everybody wanted water. It was just a thing that just like flood the streets because people was coming to Atlanta. Um, and then we made, a, we made a soundtrack to go along with the promotion. Mm. Right, and then we start shooting video. We shot videos. Mm-hmm. We shot the what's up, what's up, player poncho video during freak nick. Like, wow, Freak Nick was actually happening. So then after that point, it was just like, you know, yes, yeah, uh, this is our thing. I mean, can we talk about your role in the Freak Nick a little bit more? Because everyone, like, everyone I talk to in Atlanta says you made it what it is and you made it more widespread. I where mean, I, like where? I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually take, I don't take credit for that. I feel like yeah. I just was just promoting what was already happening. I mean, I know, like I said, we dominated, though. That was our thing, like... It was no other companies in Atlanta. You know, you got to think, it wasn't no LaFace records. Like, they wasn't doing shit compared to So So Death. Mm-hmm. And who else was there? Like, nobody else was there that was going to hold this space. And I had, you know, I had all the people that was supposed to be in the streets or all the guys that was actually out in the streets, they was all working for me. So, like, whoever Lil John was fucking with, Whatever street people he was fucking with, all of them was so so deaf. Everybody it was just like all part of what was happening. So being like the music, your presence in Atlanta, and all your production and everything, all the all the work that you're doing in the city just kind of went along with the Freak Nick itself and everything that, and it just kind of made it bigger and bigger. Yeah, I mean, like I work. said, we we would wait. It's almost like how, like I said, I don't know what like a big weekend here in Vegas is for y'all, where y'all it happens every year. Mm-hmm. This is something that happened every year, so we would talk about this all year wrong like freak nick is coming do we have enough promotion do we have the right promotion what the trucks look like what the rat what you know we talk about this for months before it happened like we was really planning so that when you got to atlanta that's all you saw you either saw freak nick or you saw so so death it was t-shirts it was everything every party we had enough promotion for anybody parties everything and, and you're working on a documentary it's going to come out yeah, so I'm, I'm going to give you a little piece of this documentary because we're talking about DJing that, right. that people don't really, um, even me, I didn't know this, right? Because I just heard you say this. Mm-hmm. You said that you looked at it and you was like, this is Miami bass. Like, it's like the Miami bass sound, mm-hmm. right? In actuality, the bass sound is actually from Atlanta. Um, 
And Luke just told me this in the documentary, and that's the only reason I'm saying this. I didn't know this. I asked Luke what made them make those records the way that they made them. Yeah. And he said that the only reason he made fast records was because Miami is like a melting pot of different nationalities, right? But it's no real sound in Miami that makes you make bass records. So he was the first person to do that. But he said that where he got that from was what was happening in Atlanta. So it was artists in Atlanta that was making records like um, Shadi, Raheem the Dream, mm -hmm. Success and Effect. Um, it's a lot of these artists that was making, like even Kilo, when Kilo came, it was like they was making bass records. And for for the for till I did this this documentary recently, I thought we was copying Miami. Oh wow! But we weren't. We was doing we was doing. So so fast forward to Luke when he made Scar. Right, I was sitting there listening to the record, and I'm like, why would he say Bankhead in that song? He's from Miami, and he put them words in there because he said only Atlanta was playing his music. Oh wow! Mm. Damn, that's crazy. Wow, this is, oh my god. When is this documentary coming out? <laughs> when is this documentary coming out? Um, next year. I next mean, year? I, I hope it's coming out cuz I'm hearing there's like a lot of a lot of flack about it. Nah, ain't no flack. <laughs> like, ain't no flack. A lot it's of freak, people who, it's freak who was it there is, that, that yeah, they're like lawyers, yeah, yeah, teachers, no flag. doctors, it's, they yeah. don't want to get seen. They went to Freak Nick. I didn't tell them to go. It's <laughs> they're they're that. They're scared <laughs> now. So you're yeah, not going to try to blur no, no, no nah, flag? Nah, nah, no. I mean, it's a documentary. You're going to see what you didn't see if you didn't go. You know what I mean? It's Freak Nick. It ain't, I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. You know, you're not going to see that because that's it was it's Freak Nick. But wow. it's from my, my lens. I was, I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I wasn't 21. So I don't even know what was happening in the clubs. And I don't know, you know, I was on the streets watching what was happening in the streets. A lot of parking lot pimping with me, right? In these parking lots, <laughs> driving around Atlanta and just seeing and being in the traffic. But it's other people that got stories that tell you, you know, about everything. I'm so, sure. um, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. This documentary, by, by the way, is more educational about hip hop than actually people even understand. Like like what I just told you, that to me is a monumental moment to me. Yeah. Cause I've been wondering why Luke said Bankhead bounce in the Scar record forever. Cause I thought, damn, Atlanta got that popping that he just he had to say something about Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it wasn't that. It was mostly like he said, the DJs in Atlanta was the only people that were supporting Luke Skywalker. Damn. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of Miami motherfuckers who are gonna just be like their hearts are gonna be broken, man. But I mean, they, nah. Shit, but you know? Miami, they'll tell they tell the same story. Really, it's like Miami. They they say that you know Miami, the the city of Miami, as far as like radio and like um, the the commercial side of Miami, they don't actually support their local artists. This is something that I've heard for years. Really? That's crazy. Yeah, I never heard that before. Nah, you really? Huh? I mean, they've always kind of like, there's been like a battle between like reggaeton, Latin music, and just all the shit in Miami. It's it's a little weird over there. So it's it's not surprising at all. Yeah. You know, you mentioned LaFace Records. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realize what a tight relationship you had with Left Eye. Like she was crashing at your crib. Yeah, yeah. well, TIC years. was my group first. Yeah, it was yeah. it was Second Nature. Right? Yeah, that was yeah. the name. Yeah, and I, you guys were writing. You know, in the early days of Crisscross, you guys were writing music, recording music together, and you guys were putting together the looks and the marketing for everything. Yeah, and then you had TLC as a group, Second Nature, and we were wondering how'd you lose it to lose them to the face or what happened. Um, well, you know, at the time, like I said, I was what seventeen. I I'm really I had no label. Mm. It was just all like me talking and telling people I'm gonna do something, and I'm like, but it got you so far, right? Yeah, I was yeah. gift of gab. <laughs> like, Cause you were doing it for like you know since you're. I mean, well, listen. The first know, record, the first record, the Silk Times Leather record, yeah, made people be like, okay, well, if he's 16 and he produced and wrote the whole album, then he must know something. So I guess they was just looking at the credits and was just like, okay, he knows something. But I had no label. I had no label. And I was just taking people like I'm gonna sign you. I'm gonna sign you. Come over here. And you, you, your pops were just kind of like going, learning as you go. Just kind of like. Well, no, my dad wasn't even involved yet. This no. was, that's what I'm saying, he wasn't involved to. Well, he was involved with Silk Times Leather. My right, dad's right. role always has been like, I'm gonna let you be the manager. I ain't never want to manage the artist. I just want to mm -hmm. make the music, right? So I had to find somebody um, that I thought I could trust 
And I felt that was more adult than me to be managers. Right. Well, I thought managers were supposed to be like this adult guy and this whole thing. I was just a music person. So I was just like, Silk Times Leather, I'd tell them about the artist, and then I'd be like, yo, let's go get these girls a deal. And you play a role as a manager, and that's what happened. So he did that with Silk Times Leather. Then that project went away, then I went and found Criss Cross, and then I came back to him and did the same thing, like you should be their manager. So it was it was just like a handoff. Once I got the artist and figured it out, I'm going to hand it off to my dad, and then they go do the management thing. Mm -hmm. And then so with, with Second Nature or TLC, you, so, you, yeah, you guys so, were just working together, but... Yeah, so in the creation of Criss Cross and TLC, I had both of them at the same time. Mm. But I guess because of guys, I was catering more to the guys than I was the girls because we had more in common. So Chris Cross used to come to my house every morning during the weekend and we'd go get haircuts and we'd go to the mall. We had we was doing more guy shit that was like hanging out. <laughs> then the girls in there, then Lisa called me, be like, what's up, what we doing? And I ain't really had nothing to do with them. Like, <laughs> it was like, um, and then, and then I go to left our house and then she was over there cutting shit up and, you know, tearing clothes up and just doing wild shit to like, Imaging, right? And I go to her house and we'd like dye her hair and right, you know. Then she she's the person that got me to go get my nose ring. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think she's the, yeah she's the, she introduced me to like my first not my first tattooist but I think like the first person that tattooed me in Atlanta left eye introduced me to him. Um, she made me cut my eyebrows off one day. <laughs> Um, like completely like, off? Yeah, yeah, cut them off completely. Because I had like, I think I had like three. Yeah, three cuts in the, in the brows. Yeah. yeah. Everybody so yeah. it was only just one half right here because the other, these, it was slit, right? So she was like, it's already, you already slit. So you only got one half. Just shave it off. And I listened to her and I shaved <laughs> <laughs> And I shaved my eyebrows off. Uh, yeah, we was just doing all kind of wild shit. So that's what I'm saying. So when we was doing all this stuff, um, it was only, um, the thinking process became do something that's just like outlandish, like do some outlandish shit. So I started taking Chris and Chris over the house and we just started thinking about things to do and kept doing things. And then one day Chris came to my house and he had this jumper on. It was jumper was like three to four, five sizes too big. Right. It was already so big that he could like he could almost change, move around in it and flip around without having to take it off. That's how big it was. So I was like Overalls right Yeah yeah, yeah. It was Jabot overalls I'm like yo You should flip them around backwards Let's go to the mall And see what happens He's like Flip them around backwards I'm like yeah You should just turn them around backwards Let's go to the mall And see what happens And he did it And we went to the mall And I seen people freaking out And I was like Oh Uh oh That's it And the rest is history well, Did you know right away That it was gonna blow up The way they did Chris Cross yeah, once we got the backwards jeans uh -huh. and I wrote Jump, it was uh -huh. over with. By the way, when we had the backwards jeans, I, did, I didn't have Jump. I still didn't have the song. Mm -hmm. So once I saw the reaction to the clothing, I started telling myself, Jermaine, you're not good enough. You haven't written a song that goes with these kids. You haven't written a song that goes with the look so the Jabro overalls created drum it kind of inspired you or motivated you to create well no it just drum, right? that just created their image because right. at, at this time like I said with TLC and well Second Nature and Criss Cross we all was like we was thinking that you had to have a look before you even had a record it didn't even matter about mm. the music it was trying to make sure that the artist looked like an artist mm. so, so our goal was like if you go somewhere Make sure that you look like somebody that somebody wants to talk to. Mm -hmm. So we was trying to figure out how to do that. Like, if I just take you to the mall, what what what's gonna make people look at you when you get to the mall? And um, that's what we used to question. We used to ask ourselves this, and we'd get our hair cut. Like I said, we shave our eyebrows. You shave your eyebrows off, you go to the mall. People are gonna be like, "Hey, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> this is New York, right? this is like, these are things that these are things that make people say." Like fuck? look at you And like look <laughs> right. at you In a place like What's going on yeah. So You know And at this time You gotta think Nobody wants Nobody young Wanted to be an artist This was a time when No kids in Atlanta Wanted to be rappers God you guys were so young Too at the time And you guys were just Doing so much Yeah You know 16 Just running around Yeah but like, it was like a, It was like a um, the, the Chris and Chris was like 11 and 12 Yeah So this was an era when 
um, like I said, nobody, and it's crazy to me when I go out in Atlanta, like everybody now got a fucking demo. Everybody. People's grandmamas, they aunts, everybody got a, everybody rap in Atlanta. This was a time <laughs> when nobody had that shit. You could go to the mall, I wouldn't see nobody talking about they had a demo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to go back to sec, second nature because I so basically you're saying over time like Pebbles just came in or they just linked up with Pebbles and then no nah, they asked could I ha could they have that meeting right which, and I was thinking about I was, wait what do you mean have that meeting so if you've seen the TLC m music I mean the TLC movie mm -hmm. the first one right Left Eye goes and gets on the phone and she makes a phone call before they take the TLC meeting we have, before they have the meeting with Pebbles now in that movie, in the in the document, I mean whatever that whatever docu series they did at VH1, they don't talk about me, but she, they show her making the phone call. When she called me, that's what she was asking me. She, she, can they have the meeting? And I was thinking like a producer, because I had got Criss Cross signed at this point in time. So I just was thinking about like, yeah, well shit, if they get signed, I have I could do all the music. I wasn't thinking about no label because I ain't have my label. Oh wow! So I was just like, yeah, have the meeting. Let's see what happens. And they got signed, and that's what, and that's it. Yeah, that's, what that's happened. it. And but but a lot of the majority of their first album was Dallas Austin, right? Yeah, all of the albums basically. Yeah. Was, I mean, you know, um, besides Crazy Sexy Cool, I mean, I did like with all the intros, and I did Kick Your Game, and I did a uh, Switch. Yeah, I did all of the Crazy Sexy Cool intros, and all of that when they first come on that Crazy Sexy Cool. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, 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 with you thinking that you were going to produce, like, oh, shit, I'm going to produce like some of the TLC like the whole shit. album? And yeah, yeah, that's all I was thinking about. But, like, but, yo, shit, if they get signed to a major label. Because yeah. you got to think, we still was, Criss Cross still hadn't popped yet, mm -hmm. right? So this was still like, nobody in Atlanta had still touched major money or major label success. So all I was thinking about was like, if TLC gets signed and they get signed to a major label, it'll be another one that I have as an outlet for me to get out here. That's he, all I was thinking. So did he kind of fuck with you that like you did almost no you did no production on the first album? Nah, because I was in crisscross success. That you know. oh, you were just busy with that. Yeah. Shit. yeah, it wasn't even. I wasn't even paying no attention to that. Do do deals and like I don't know. Do deals like that happen all the time where they just kind of like you know? Oh, I, I could have signed you know, TLC or even recently yeah, always with like Lotto. Like yeah. you know, she was on the show, The Rap Game. Yeah, but even like, like, yeah. but see, the, but see, the thing about the Lotto situation is that once again, it's like people don't pay attention. Lotto, I put Lotto record out. You guys just didn't pay attention to it. Hmm. I put a record out, but she was a young artist. When I put Lotto out, she was sixteen. She wasn't talking about sex, and she was just a kid. Yeah, and nobody give gave a fuck, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it. You know what I mean? That's that's the end of the. That was it. That was my deal. You win on a rap game, I put your record out. I put a record out, then nobody paid that much attention to it. But that shit just happens all the time then. Well, it's kind of like you kind of work with an artist and then it's just not the right time and then all of a sudden years pass. Maybe, you know, they need the experience, they need, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, artists need to, they need to grow, they need into, develop, they need to grow right? into themselves or the audience has to catch up, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, like, like I said, a lot of times I be making records that's so young, making artists that's so young. The fans and the people and DJ, everybody, they just don't be like catching it immediately when it come out. So they get by the time the artists get five years down the road, then people start paying attention to them, right? So like you say, like, um, I just posted about Young Dylan, right? I did Young Dylan and Lele, right? Now, right now, the video has ten million views. It just came out last year, right? It's, so I'm I be looking at all the other views of all these new artists that come out. And they be in the same rack. They basically in the same bracket space. Some of them are eight million, seven, five, mm -hmm. but they older. And they talking about killing people and smoking and all that. And everybody think that's the shit. These kids, is, you know, they twelve, thirteen. They not doing that. They got the same amount of views, and nobody ain't paying no attention to them. Right? It's nobody talking about it. So by the time they get seventeen, then it's gonna be everybody gonna be old. Oh, young Dylan, I fuck with him. Like mm -hmm. what? You know what I'm saying? That's 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 how I look at it. That's what that's you know what I mean. That's and that's that's just me being able to do what I do. And I started in a space where and and I went through this so much that you not paying attention to it don't even matter to me because I I understand what it does for me. What like this era that we're in right now is this the hardest era to like just market and promote music right no. now? No, no, you don't think so? No, really? I I feel like what? How do you feel about like hip hop not having as many? 
I don't know, hit songs as, as in prior years than before. Even as club DJs, it's getting harder and harder to DJ. I mean, they don't, people that's doing it don't know what they're doing. That's basically what it is for me. You know, you got to listen to what, listen to this interview. Like, whoever's listening to this interview, <laughs> go back to what I just said about what we used to do with Left Eye and Criss Cross. We used to sit there and make sure that the artists looked like artists before they even had records, right? Name an artist right now that you feel like looks like a star before you heard their song. Mm. Nobody. I'm not even gonna let you even. I'm not even gonna let y'all sit here and think about it. It's nobody. It's nobody out that you can say, "Oh, this guy looked amazing before I even heard his music." Nobody. It's not. It. Nobody even thinks about this. Now, I'm not saying I created the wheel, but I'm saying. I feel like that was more, more of that was happening in the era of what you're talking about when hip hop was like, like Busta Rhymes. Busta Rhymes thought about what his video was going to look like. Mm-hmm, yeah. I'm going to make, I'm going to remake Coming to America. I'm going to do it. They thought about this shit. It's not like a, let's go down to the bodega and shoot a video. Like, this all people is doing right now. Let's go to the bodega and shoot the video right now. Yeah, let's go to the park. Well, yeah, what? like, what? I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right, because I think yeah. one of the rappers that are, like, killing it right now from New York, from the Bronx, is Ice Spice. And mm-hmm. she looks like a star. She, I feel like she's one of the, the rare, like, rappers right now where she looks the part, and she's acting the part. Like, she's actually carrying it. She's herself. shooting all her videos at the bodega. But I, f- I feel like her look <laughs> itself in New York, like, she's yeah, killing in New York. you can't shoot all your videos at the bodega. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't do that. But in New you York itself, she's killing it right now in New yeah, York. I'm just saying. You can't shoot all your videos. <laughs> You're going to run out of bodega. At the bodega. <laughs> you got you to gotta put a little bit more creativity as in, you know, if she looks like a star to people... I think she stand, like, I think she stands out from okay, a lot that's of the saying. So if you yeah. feel, if you have that element, yeah, you gotta push to the next element. You gotta push to find a you know find which I a, feel like she will eventually do. Like I went through this with Bow Wow, right? So I had Bow Wow. Mm-hmm. To me, I felt like I put Bow Wow at the end of Big Mama's house video with me and Nas and Monica, right? Yeah, and. You know, I start seeing people pay attention to Bow Wow, and he's like, "Oh, who's the little kid at the end of the video? We love it, da 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 da." But I was like, "I can't put Bow Wow out without that that thing. Like something has to happen with Bow Wow for everybody to respond." So I know that I did what I feel like I did with everybody else that came out, and um, the fact that he was with Snoop prior, I kept saying, "Okay, let me see what would it look like." I'm stealing if I turn Bow Wow into a dog and he the same way Snoop did. And everybody's like, you're going to turn him into a dog? And it was like, I started realizing that 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 element was going to create this conversation that I was talking about. And just that little piece of thing, Bow Wow, a dog running down the street and Bow Wow actually coming up and being that dog changed his whole life. Like, just that little creative element Made people be like, "Oh, this little motherfucker's crazy." <laughs> and it was just like, I remember that's that video. It. That video's crazy. I'm just, and then, by the way, that's just that's nothing. That's what I'm saying. You just had to do something that you can't be just like you can't be just at the bodega, man. You can't do it. <laughs> you can't do it. That's oh, I mean, the CGI, uh, yeah. the cost, <laughs> maybe the cost for music videos at the time was a lot larger. Yeah. I feel like she's doing everything independent and grassroots, but I don't know. You think that? I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you have more information? I saw her record say Capital. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, yeah. like in the beginning, was her. Was in the her beginning, her, before she, she first came out, she was, was independent. She was independent. It was like, yeah, but we talking about today. Yeah. Right now, she just shot a new video. At the right. bodega. At the bodega. Yeah. At the Delhi. Bodega. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to song. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah. man, listen. listen you, like I said, you got to go back to like Busta, Missy, and these artists that you see. But, that but people, also, the label don't have the money that they had back in the what? day. What? You think so? Look at his face. Are you serious? They don't have. Did you you see how much money that Universal just said they made? No, I didn't. How much? Three billion dollars. Do you remember anybody in the nineties? You don't. You never heard Russell Simmons say Def Jam made three billion. No, not at all. No. Okay. You think they don't have the money? That's from. That's from. I feel like a majority is that from old catalogs, though. No, it's not. No, no. They making hand over fist on new music. Yes. No. Yeah. One of. I I I heard that like uh, new music takes up about twenty five to thirty percent of all the new of of all the streams. I mean, well, first of all, revenue. listen, we we don't 
It's not our job to figure out where they're getting the money from. He mm-hmm. said he don't think they make. They have the money. It doesn't matter where they get it what? from. That's they why. have the money to spend the money if you are artists to do it. But the artists are not being creative to push the labels to do what they're supposed to do. Wait. And everybody wants to be so street. So everybody like, yo, I just want to shoot, you know. Let's put a CGI airplane in the middle of the bodega, right in front of the bodega. Like, what? Yo, Jay, why you, what you got against the bodega, no, man? No, I'm just saying, I'm, because I'm saying, I'm saying. They got, you, no, you, you, they got no bodegas in ATL? No, like, what's we, up? we got like gas stations. You can shoot in front of the gas station. Uh, we see nah, some of those. Yeah, no, nah, I, I, I'm just saying, I just uh, use that as like a, you know. Yeah. That's Because yeah. I, I see that more than anything. Mm-hmm. I see that now in every, in every video. I mean, she I has see. been shooting in the bodegas a lot. Not just yeah. her. I'm yeah. saying I see Everybody, other people. Yeah. Everybody, Everybody's, videos. Yeah, right, I, 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 I see other people doing it. <laughs> like right so on the street, right on the corner of the street. So it's just like videos. this era right now, would you say is the most undesirable in your opinion? Or like you're just not impressed? Like maybe the lowest, I don't know. No, no, nah, nah, I, don't, I don't feel, I feel like I like all the music. I'm not, I mean, I'm, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's just they don't have all of the, they haven't gone through enough to understand what everything they should be doing. Like, I went through hell. I went through being in New York and having a DJ tell me, I fuck with you, but this record ain't going on the radio. <laughs> like, I don't think these artists could go through that. I don't even think none of these artists could take a, art, a DJ saying, you hear about somebody fighting every time somebody say this. Like, it's not about fighting. It's about taking creative criticism and taking it and go make some more shit. Like, mm-hmm. I went through this. I don't know if this... This era of artists can go through that. Nothing hurts me if you tell me you don't like my music. Even with with some of the newer artists that you work with, right? Do you sense that there's like uh, there isn't that thicker skin to the de- for development where they can like develop more? They're like yeah, more but they sensitive. don't want to hear that. They're they're more sensitive now. I mean, they just don't understand what it means to, you know, to go through the process of somebody saying no. Right, I actually I actually tweeted this the other day. I was listening to R and B re- records that I did for Usher new album mm. and some other records that not coming out. Right, and I was just thinking about it, like, damn, if I was an R and B artist, you know how much music I would put out and how much music would actually be out here going around if I was the R and B artist, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I saw the comments and I saw people responding on Twitter and saying, you know. Well, I'm an R and B artist, and I got more records than you. And uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Who, and, they're brave out there. And <laughs> Katie, just, why, why are you people, on Twitter? But why people, are you doing this? Why are you looking at comments on Twitter? I mean, I'm on there. I'm on there. So, so even even on so on threads, you're supposed to talk more. So I said it on threads, and more people saying it on threads. They like, yeah, you know. But it's a man out there named Babyface, and it's a man out there named da da da. And I'm like, you guys. You just don't understand what I'm saying, right? Most people that, even like you're a young writer, you still haven't gone through. I, I've i delivered music to L.A. Reid, and he told me, this ain't it. I've taken him records that I've mixed, and he'd be like, this, who mixed this record? This don't sound right, right? I don't think this generation could go through that. I don't think they have the skin to even go through somebody telling you this, and then you actually just walking out the office and going back and trying to make it better, and so that you can come back to that office and have that meeting again. So when he when he ever tell you to stunt these things, would you agree with him? No. Or would you fight him? And be like, nah, no, you're wrong. I'm young. You know, you don't, you know, young people don't agree with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you're crazy. I don't. I don't. I'm not agreeing. I'm not in agreement at all. What, what's but, the, What's the biggest argument you've had? Where you 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 knew the song was a hit, or you knew the the artist was had potential, and um. The label didn't agree, and you had to prove them wrong, and you end up being right. Well, it's not about me proving them wrong. It's uh-huh. just like you just let them do what they got. They well, just run, let if the they run the label, out, they right? run the label. It's not about me proving anybody wrong. It's just me proving myself that I'm right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I have a bunch of the records like My Boo, Usher, and Alicia Keys. Yeah, that yeah. was left off Confessions. Oh, that was supposed to be on Confessions. What? The yeah. F- wow. <sighs> Yeah, it was left off. Why was it left off? What was their argument? Do you remember? It, wasn't, it didn't sound like a hit to somebody. Wow. Wow, man. That's disappointing as fuck. <laughs> but it sounded like a hit to me, right? So I'm like, you know, if, like I said, and, and, and respectfully, I, I respect what people do. I respect your job. If you got a job or you own the label, this is your choice to make. I'm just a worker. 
I'm just working. I mean, I don't, and I'm not the guy that's gonna like sit there and like scream and holler about my songs until you put it on there because I don't want you to give me no charity. I want the hit to be a real hit record. If if it's not, if you believe it's not a hit record and you have had the success that L.A. Reid has had, then I must go with you. Like, okay, maybe you know, you know, I'm just a little guy that probably just thinks. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times you can get lost into the thinking and not not actually knowing. How did the Emancipation of Mimi? You're like with you and all the production you did. You basically changed Mariah Carey's career. It was kind of like I can't do that, huh? I can't do, change Mariah Carey's career. Uh, it was kind of going. <laughs> it, down. it was at a point when <laughs> it she was, was. It was kind listen, of. Listen, if you sell 130 million records, nobody oh. can do <laughs> shit. But she was going through a period after the Glitter album, the, the movie. She still stuff. sold 130 million. Ain't nobody even did that. I don't even know. Like that's what I'm saying. Like I understand what y'all are saying, yeah. but that's yeah. just you can't. You, I can't. I could just help the person who, who needed records. But well, you definitely did that. That's all. That I look, album. Yeah, yeah, that's all I looked well, at. With the climate with her was a little like you know it was. Yeah, a people little, was trying to change, turn right. their head on her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. And you kind of turned that whole thing around with Emancipation and Mimi. And then what was the approach for you, and how did you guys link up to work on that? Um, well, I had been making Mariah records forever, yeah. so so it was like, you know, and then once again, it was L.A. Reid in, in the mix, right? So I had just did Confessions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. He was just like. He kind of felt like if he's making another album, um, you know, he started feeling like it was probably impossible to make a new album with Mariah Carey and Jermaine Dupri not being on the album. And then one of his favorite songs was always be my baby that I did for her anyway. One of my favorite yeah. songs. Oh, yeah. so you know, so he was just like, Jermaine, can you find this again? And I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, like, can you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's people be asking me that. Can you make make me one of these? And I'm like, yeah, well, okay. I don't know where that. You know, you must get was, that all the time. Oh yeah, huh? all the time. Try to recreate whatever that is, and I'm like. I can't do that. I could try. We could try to get close to that. So, We Belong Together was me trying to outdo Always Be My Baby. Mm. Well, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I got flack here because I said that was a song of the decade because you had said that. And I'm like, who who said this? that's the song of the decade? Oh, no, it was. <laughs> yeah. And I keep, I'm, I'm going to die on that hill because I was like, yo, that's the song of the decade. And I remember Graham, I think, he was like, who? Where the fuck? Who gave him that award? Yeah, I was, was like, I don't know who gave him that award, but I remember Jermaine saying that was a song of the decade. Yeah, it was. <laughs> who, I mean, you know, we in the era. Who gave never we, no, we, no, were wrong. we were wrong. We were wrong. We were wrong. We were Billboard. Yeah. Billboard. Billboard. That was a billboard. A billboard. The, a billboard the one time does he's this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Billboard the does this. They do song of the decade at at the you know, and they do their year end thing, mm-hmm. and it becomes the song of the decade. Um and. Um, it was the song of the decade. So the there whole decade of the 2000s, We Belong Together was the number one record. So when you were working on that record, or the album with Mariah Carey, there wasn't this energy that like, yo, this, we have to kind of bring her back not with for this me. album. No, really? Not for me. I don't, from I don't, her I don't, side or the I, label? I don't, nothing? I don't buy into that type of stuff. I just go based on what you asked me to do. I'm not really... Because from an outsider in, like even as DJs, we were like... Yo, this is glitter was so like that of that era of Mariah was so bad. We were like, there's no way. Yeah, no, nah, I, I mean, because I wasn't part of that. You yeah. know what I mean? I wasn't part of that project like that, so I don't, I don't get that. I don't like carrying that weight of records anyway. So like, if you're trying to come to me to fix your life, <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't bring that to me because I don't want that. I don't want that. Like that's a that's a hard, you know that's. Pause. That's something very, very <laughs> different to carry. You know what I mean? You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want. You can't walk around with that type of energy. Um, and knowing that that's what people are. You know, I want you to pay attention to songs more than. You know, Jermaine helped her get her life back together. He helped him get. I can't. I can't be responsible for that. What, what, was that some of your favorite work, or like, what's what's your favorite work? Well, I mean, it's some of my favorite work when people start discussing Jermaine Dupri because it's funny to me because like when people start having these arguments about Jermaine Dupri, I be seeing people that be trying to still like throw little shots, and they be like, "Yo, he was, you know, he was the shit in the '90s," and I'm like, "The '90s? No. Do you realize no. that I had Song of the Decade in 2000?" 
Like that means the decade, the whole decade. <laughs> I don't think people even be it's, it's, like it's crazy yeah. because a lot of the work you did in the two thousands R and B, a lot of the R and B and like records that you made in the two thousands are like the soundtrack to every R and B day party and like nightclub right now. Yeah, like, yeah. It, you know, it's and literally. That, by the like, way, and you know? that's that's not to cut you off. That's why I came here because I want. I feel like you guys as a DJ podcast should be more famous. Than what you actually are. Oh, thanks, right? Jermaine. Because because I'm saying you guys are talking about shit that actually really matters to making music turn into what it actually does, and that's mm -hmm. why I don't want to feel like people like all these other podcasts. They're just doing interviews and not nothing wrong with that, but it's cool. But I'm saying it's a lot of times that these you know you should be a podcast. Pay attention to a podcast that actually is giving out gems about records turning into. What they turn into, right? So just you saying that right now about how when you go to day parties and just that a third, this music is the music that people want to hear, right? It's, a lot of DJs. It's everything yes. you did in the two thousands is literally like the, in every day party and every R and B day mm -hmm. party. It's like it rings on. It's all these JD songs, so anywhere from Jagged Edge, uh, Let's Get Married remix to Bow Wow, Let Me Hold You Down, to the Sierra record, to Mariah Carey, to Usher. Where, where the party at? Where the party at. It, it's literally yeah. the soundtrack, and it's I would say it almost embodies the whole 2000 sound of mm -hmm. R&B for these day parties and R&B parties for the youth right now. Yeah, that's and, and that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't think that people understand that because yeah. they don't hear a lot of DJs talk like this. They don't hear people talk about this from that perspective. They just hear a lot of people arguing about it. Right, and that's where it starts the Puff JD conversation and all that stuff. That's when it starts happening because they don't hear enough. Wait, of, what's the Puff D? What's the Puff JD conversation? You, hear? I mean, you know the versus thing that people keep right. trying to, you know, when they start talking about this. <laughs> How do you people, feel about that? You have some DJs that's still thinking that they were playing more Bad Boy in 2000 than they was playing So So Dead. Mm. That's that's like not true <laughs> that's not even like me sitting here trying to be cocky that's an untrue statement it's funny because like a lot of the remixes you were making in the 2000s i was like i was looking forward to the so so death remix yeah even the mariah carey the honey record the remix that you guys did with the brat on it yeah yesterday I, was the 20th anniversary that day she, she put out the vinyl yesterday oh, wow. oh really oh yeah. shit I thought that was the better version. In my opinion, like it was the easier, it was it had like more energy in the club. It was easier to play in the club for me. Mm -hmm. It was on rotation in New York. Obviously the the OG with or the remix with Mace and with Jada the um, genius and love the locks beat. and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. hitting. But um I mean that that remix and everything you did in the two thousands, it, it speaks volumes. It's it's still like it's aged so well and it's like more relevant. And it's almost like the sound of R and B to the young like when I speak to the youth and I see the crowd yeah. and the day parties, they're reacting to all of these records. And yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Song. I don't that's that's the part I'm talking about. I'm saying like from a DJ's perspective, you're seeing it from a DJ's perspective. You're watching the crowd. Mm -hmm. It's not enough of that happening in the music industry period today where yeah. people are speaking from the perspective of actually working and watching what's happening, right? Well, that's I'm, the that's the problem with critics sometimes is that they're really I don't so like they're speaking from I don't know, like a personal opinion on what's relevant right now yeah but that's what i said these guys ain't even be in the clubs yeah you can't speak on what's happening in the clubs if you don't go to the club <laughs> you're just assuming what's happening you know so what, what what's your favorite era that you've been that you've experience. made music in or even experienced in and maybe maybe look at it from two different perspectives what's your favorite era personally that you experienced as just jd and then what's your favorite era as a producer a writer songwriter Record maker. Um, probably the nineties. The nineties. The late nineties era was probably the best for me as far as producing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just because it made you, it made you have to be more creative because this person was being more creative, right? So when people are being creative, you can't even come to the party thinking you're just gonna show up. You gotta show up with some shit. You and you had a lot of competition back. <laughs> yeah, then. yeah, you gotta you gotta show up. You gotta come in the party with. All kind of shit, sparklers, champagne, cake. You gotta come in the motherfucker with a. You better come to the party with all kind of things as opposed to just showing up. Um, and that that era to me, as far as being creative and writing and all of that, you had to try to like figure it out. Um, that was that was probably the most fun for me. So what would be your favorite record, or what was the record to you that you remember the most, or that was maybe the most impactful for you? 
um, money anything like like mm. you know um, because I knew who Jay Z was I knew exactly where he was probably gonna end up to not today but at a, at a point in time I knew that Jay Z was gonna be the person that he became to hip hop right I just had that feeling because I listened to his music and I was listening to him and I'm like once people start fucking with this guy the way that they supposed to it's kind of it's gonna be a landslide he's gonna be like the guy um, and when I you know when I chose to make that song Columbia was like why Jay-Z who is this guy why we, why you want this to be your single and I'm just like yeah I just don't you just don't understand right and it was like um that record was just for me um I was listening to clue tapes it was all like it was like you said New York I was listening to and I was still Going back to my mindset of like red alerting them, they shit on me. <laughs> this person, they shit on that really, that really, that ready. really like shaped. Yeah, your, a, it definitely impacted it, me as a kid shaped, being into hip hop because yeah. you wanted, you know, you wanted to be in the mix. You know, what I mean, you got to think. I came from a tour where I was surrounded around all of these people, and all you want to do is be. You want to stay at that party. You don't want to go to nobody else's party. You want to mm -hmm. go to that party. You want to figure out how you can continue to keep going to that party, right? Right. So that was, yeah, that was one of my goals, is just try to figure out how to continue to keep going to that party. So when Clue started popping, um, it started being like a thing to be like the first song on a Clue mixtape, right? Mm -hmm. But I even took it even further, because I'm like, I'm going to be the first person from Atlanta to have the first song on Clue mixtape. Nobody wasn't even thinking about this. Nobody in Atlanta wasn't thinking about this. I just was saying this in my head. I'm going to be the first person from Atlanta to be the first song you hear on the Clue mixtape. And when I made one anything, that's what happened. I, so I was I was cool at that point. I had to go gold or nothing. When Clue called me, he was like, yo, I'm putting this song first. I was like, yes. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. It was that stamp of approval from the from. No, nah, it just like, was hip hop. It was, it was just hip -hop. hip hop. It's a hip hop thing, you know. For me, it was like hip hop because you understand, hip hop in Atlanta was not nothing. Mm -hmm. We are a hip hop station. We don't have no hip hop station, and they played hip hop in Atlanta on V one hundred three for an hour on Friday nights. So you had to wait till Friday to hear all rap on for really? one hour in the nineties. Or, Fuck yeah! Really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't do this. I didn't realize it was that. Uh, I don't what? know. Like <laughs> for so long, <laughs> yeah, for a long time. Like maybe because you know, we're so then spoiled. It, then, it, then it started changing. It started switching a little bit. But I'm saying prior, like crisscross. You know what I mean? You gotta think like this. Where where I came from, this what was happening. It was you know and and. Like, that's why I say in, in Money Anything, I mean, oh, in Welcome to Atlanta, I say Shadi, if you was riding, you was bumping the homie Shadi, he was the only person you heard in Atlanta, ever. That was that was another record yeah, yeah. that was, that was record. so big. That was huge in New York. But the remix was so huge in New York. That was <laughs> Once like, again, that yeah. was another thing again. Like, I was sitting there like, yo, okay, I made a record called Welcome to Atlanta. Nobody in LA and New York is going to play this song. We, I mean, we I, I really liked the record, but we was not, it was just hard to rock it in the club. See? You know, yeah. no, I, yeah. no, I, don't, I was actually playing Welcome to Atlanta. Yeah. I thought that was dope. But it was the, a good. It was but a dope when the record. remix came out, it was just like, all right, it was a this monster. is taking yeah. it to another level. It was a yeah, so that was the thing. So it was like, okay, y'all keep saying me and Puff is battling each other. <laughs> Put Puff on the song, and then I'm gonna let Puff do New York. That way, you know, the record get it's played in New York. New York. Yeah. And then once I did that, it was like, let's just make it everywhere. So then everybody could play their own little part. Put Snoop on it. <laughs> L.A. could play it. Blah blah blah. It was just determination of like breaking into all of these places. Did you strategize where you put each city? Because in LA, we would play the whole record because LA was the last one. Yeah. So did you strategize nah, nah, New nah, York nah, in the nah, middle nah, and then nah. LA? I just, I, you know, really the Midwest supposed to have been in the middle. I mean, it is because it's Murphy. But um, Nelly, my man, I tried, Nelly's supposed to have been on that part. But Nelly was like, yo, let's break Murph on the record. And I don't never really had no problem breaking artists and then, you know, Nelly, my man. So I just like, let's put Murphy Lee on there. To represent the Midwest, so it was supposed to be me, Puff Daddy, Nelly, and Snoop Dogg. Did, did you ever get an opportunity, or was there ever an opportunity for you to work with Tupac? No, no, because I, you know, Tupac was prior. Um, because you were telling me that Tupac was in Atlanta a lot. Yeah, he was because he was dating. Yeah, I mean, I know Tupac. I mean, mm -hmm. me, we, I knew Tupac well, but we, didn't, I wasn't. Um, when I was on tour, I wasn't making records, and Tupac was out. You know what I mean? He was in Digital Underground. I wasn't making music back then. Uh. 
Yeah, because I always wonder. I'm like, why did that never? Because he was dating Left Eye, I think, at a point, and they yeah, were yeah, out. but but it was still like you know, um, it just was a different. It was a different, like I said, and I the only thing that was successful about Jermaine Dupri at that time was Crisscross, and this one hip hop didn't want young people to be a part of hip hop. Mm. You know what I mean? Like being young and being in hip hop was like no. Yeah. Right. So so you know I used to get criticized for working with younger artists. Right, everybody used to talk shit about me saying Jermaine. All he do is make kids stars and da 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 da. People don't even remember that now. Like everybody young now, so everybody yeah. like, oh JD, you don't know what you're talking about, nigga. I'm the reason why you have you can brat. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like you know. But anyway, well, uh, but not for nothing. Chris Cross, like Jump, used to get played in the cl- New York clubs back in the days when it came out. Yeah, like New York loved that fucking song. Man. Yeah, I mean, but Chris Cross, we did a lot of work. You know, Chris Cross was like the only group. 11 and 12 that actually performed the SOBs. Hmm. It was on a yes. bill. Yeah. It was on a bill with Cypress Hill and Daz Effects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like a, it was Chris Cross, Daz Effects, and Cypress Hill. Damn. Yeah, one of my favorite records was on <laughs> was the second album, the single with Supercat. I thought that was one, yeah. of, one yeah. of their best singles. In my, like, All right. I thought it was dope. All right. And by the way, like you, if you look at like these songs, right, the thing about it was like the stuff that I was doing was trying to create for Atlanta, right? I was like, we gonna make, we gonna be like the first group from Atlanta to do a record with a dance hall artist. Nobody actually credits Criss Cross for doing that, but they were. They was like, you know what I mean? We was doing stuff that nobody in Atlanta was even thinking about doing. I don't even know if anybody from Atlanta has a record with a dance hall artist to this day. Not like that. Yeah, it was, it was, all, cra- it was crazy because it was such a West Coast sounding record and then you had like this dance hall on it and it made it somehow like East Coast. And it was just like it was just like such a unique blend at the time. I think. Yeah, see, I, just, I, I think the samples, you know, what I mean, because like the touch of love, I don't have anything to do with making mm-hmm. it sound. You know, I think these are records that just resonate with different areas. Yeah. Because I, I never thought that that sounded West Coast. That must be like a song that maybe it was like probably, the, maybe it was like the chords. Like that's what I'm saying. Key, that's all keyboard, samples. Yeah. It's all samples. So it's not me. It's just a sample. So you know, what I mean, if it if it, that's what I'm saying, if it caters towards a a, a um. Uh, an area, then that area must have listened to that music more than the different other samples. Was there ever a time where you were struggling um, to like make music and like kind of, I don't know, just kind of like, I don't know, were you fighting to stay relevant or, no. you know, never? When you when you start as young as I start, is you are the word revel- relevant. It's nobody more relevant than me because I'm young. I, you know what I mean? I started, be, I start the process way before anybody else. So I never even understand what that means. If somebody says that to me, I'm like, you can't be talking about me. You got to be talking about somebody else that's like 10 years older than me because I've, everything I have ever done has been younger than anybody else that's ever came out in this industry. Well, like I, I, I asked this because I was wondering, like around the 2010s, there was like kind of maybe, I don't know, there was a maybe a, a couple years or a few years where you weren't really putting out or making music, or maybe you were making music and it wasn't getting put out, or maybe I don't it wasn't know. listed on discography. 2010, I don't know. He was doing a bunch of those remixes, like the I'm the Ish. He was doing like shit. more EDM, like dance music. But that yeah, was yeah, like that, 2009. That, but I, that's what I'm saying. I think that was yeah. like more or less like a, like like I said, as I was going through the the, turn, the DJ era, Yeah, mm-hmm. I wasn't making as, as much records as I was Usually making before you were because DJing? I was DJing mm. um, and I was out on the road and it, like that's not a real reason to do it but I was also dedicated to DJing. I was just telling Lathan this when we was just coming through here, coming here. Like the, you know, I used to be in Miami every week. I used to be in Vegas every week. Mm-hmm. I was going wherever they was asking me to DJ. Right. Like I was actually being like doing this DJ thing um, and. I actually was, I was having fun doing it too. I wasn't even really tripping on like. I mean, you were one of the few, one of the few like, like celebrity like DJs that were trying to like improve and like really. And I wasn't. Even, I didn't like that word celebrity, celebrity? DJ. I don't yeah. like that word. I'm, I'm a DJ. <laughs> Write that off. Yeah, I don't like that celebrity <laughs> DJ shit because that means like oh, he can't really DJ. Like he's just a celebrity. No, but you, that everybody I mean, knows. I don't like that. I don't well, like that. I don't play. I mean, that. like D Nice is kind of a, a celebrity DJ. 
too at a certain point. Nah, you know? he's been a DJ. Yeah, but he but this but like you know, he's just this, a DJ this, that became this, this popular. Yeah. But people know who he is. Yeah, yeah he's just a DJ Before that became popular. Before he was a popular. DJ. I mean, yeah. yeah. This is how working DJs, we say you guys are superstar DJs. You're just yeah, celebrity. But, you can't, but like D nice, he came, he was he's the DJ, he's a DJ for BD. Yeah, but he's but for us he's so big, he's a celebrity DJ. And he's bringing you know out pause. Like, like he's yeah, doing uh, Michelle Obama's like Yeah, but know. that's just work, man. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just work. Like you you feel like Lil John is a celebrity DJ? Yes, yes. No yeah. way. Yeah, mass, yeah. He's been. I met Lil John in the club DJ. I know, but I'm just well, saying. Well, we know like, Lil yeah. John from from his songs before he was a DJ. Even though he'd been DJing forever. But no, we, the, th- the thing is, we still look at him as a DJ. I just think when you're widely like widely known, and people know you from like you know, I don't know that what was that the the Trump TV show and all this the, the David the Chappelle the sketch. Chappelle sh- sketch. He's a celebrity, so you're a celebrity yeah, I mean, DJ. Yeah, you know? he, he, yeah. I mean, I guess, but I, I guess say it, I just yeah. think it just becomes like you know. It, it, it feels like a crutch to me when they still, when, not, not you guys, but when I hear yeah. other people saying it, like that's what I'm saying. When I saw Tommy Lee name, I'm like, this is celebrity DJ, yeah. oh, right? Because yeah. I'm like, how the fuck is the guy, that, yeah. is Tommy Lee, the trench coat dude, right, right, right. DJ? Yeah. And I was like, I want to go to the club and hear this, right? So I actually, <laughs> you went, yeah, very, I went to a the very club. DJ oh, wow. thing of him to do. I went to the club to see what the fuck he was DJing. <laughs> And that's when I realized, oh, he is stealing money. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, man, this can't be. I got to do this. Right? It's no way possible I don't try to do this because I'm saying they're allowing this to happen. But it was a club that was right beside the sugar. It was like a sugar factory or something that had just opened. Oh. It was a club that was like right there where they used to give you the drinks. They used it was to smoke. Caesar's. Caesar's Palace. I don't yeah, I don't know. Um, but it was a pure? club that was like. It was like a club, and he was DJing, and they had like a was it the Sugar Factory or one of these? It had to be pure. It had to be candy, pure. candy spots or whatever it was where mm-hmm. you eat, and that and that was by the way that was part of it. Once you was get it, um, you get the job, the Paris Hotel was it Chateau? Maybe. I, How long ago was this? Well, you let us know. It was the <laughs> It was, I, but I remember him DJing that light. This was like in 2005, and he got booed off. Well, he but got he, pulled. He got pulled off. Yeah, yeah. But he was DJing after that at other venues. I don't forgot where. But but I don't know where. So that's what I'm saying. This, I, don't, I don't know what year this was, but this was you know a long time ago. And I actually went to. I went to. I wanted to hear what he was playing because I actually wanted to be like. Damn, I went to see Tommy Lee and he was playing that shit. But you know that didn't, <laughs> that's, that's, not what I, <laughs> that's not what happened. But I, you know I didn't know what to expect. But I went. Not thinking that I was going to be inspired to be start DJing. Mm-hmm. But, uh. And then once I started, like I said, once I started, I realized that you have to give, I mean, I guess that's just me, the type of person I am. You, I give all of me to whatever it is. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, I'm not that's what I was saying yeah. is that you were really focused on. So, yeah. Was you downloading music? or you, you, yeah, That's what we do all day. All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> we just did that last night for the uh, champ fight. Uh-huh. We just sitting there downloading music. That's just what we do. You know what I mean? Like you... You, you can't be no DJ You don't download the music I mean I know DJs That have someone That does it for them And they just Yeah, yeah. I mean Lathan He does it for me But uh-huh. <laughs> I'm sitting there saying Like we sit there And talk about the records That but I want know, him to you, download uh-huh. oh, I don't want to open My computer up And see a whole bunch of records I never heard before Like no fucking way Like I need to know What, what, you know what we you just play, talked you know about what you play, You know I'm playing these songs uh-huh. You know so whenever, we, whenever I was trying to say somebody was like structuring people's sets, yeah, yeah, no, nah, no, yeah, nah, no, nah. you don't do. You that. would never do that. No, nah. I don't even have no sets. We just talked about this yesterday. Like we be having conversations about this. Like people be doing these same sets. We be going to hear people DJ. Mm-hmm. They got these same Routine. fucking yeah. sets and routines. They gotta stop. Wait, it. They, who, they, they get the Can you name names? Can you name names? I'm not doing it. They gotta stop this shit. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta cut that out. They gotta stop doing that because it's just it's not you know. It don't have no growth to it. Like, you know, the thing about me, what I DJ is I go to people's city and I turn on the radio when I get in the city. I'm starting to listen to what the people in the city listening to. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm trying to figure out, do I have anything that goes with whatever the locals are going to fuck with if it's a party? Right. So I already know what I like, but then I have to start adding what I feel like they like. Or if I feel Mm -hmm. like the person whose party it is, they for a younger person. Right, so like last night, I felt like um, the Crawford party at Top Golf it was probably gonna be a little bit more ratchet than what I have been doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I started downloading all the ratchet you shit. Were downloading Skiyi mm-hmm. and Pound Town. Ski. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's it. We was pound tounding it out. Pause. Pause. Big pause. <laughs> wow. Pound would, town. Would you text like DJs like you arrived today sitting and like, yo, where you playing? Or- oh yeah, I used to do that all the time. I used to ask people that all the time. So you're really working the whole scene out. Like you were just like. Just hanging out with Stone Rock, it was just not for the vlog. It was like you were. Well, out. I mean, hanging out with Stone Rock was just like all comedy. It wasn't yeah. even about <laughs> DJing. Like <laughs> I, I just, I you know, I, I used to watch them, you know, um, watch Stone Rock and and and, and um, Graham, Graham and Graham and like really be amazed at like the records that they was playing. How they would play. Stone Rock don't give a fuck about the crowd, by the yeah. way. Yeah. He goes off into his own, like, yeah. I'm yep. playing whatever the fuck I want to play right now. And the people still was fucking with them. And I used to be like, that's interesting. Right? So I always, like, I'm always interested in, like, DJs and how they, what their minds is doing. Like, that's why I used to go listen to Diplo. Because mm-hmm. Diplo used to be playing all kind of weird break beats and rock shit. At the Palms And You know Almost trying to do What AM was doing Yeah mm-hmm. But it was his own way Of doing it Because AM's from LA And Diplo's from Philly So he still had A different style About doing it But he was mixing records The same way And I used to be like That's interesting I could never do a set like that Cause it felt like People really? looking at me To do something different Than just like Play my own Be in my own space it's- But I, I, mean, I went and checked out Every DJ Who's ever supposed to be a named DJ? You checked out Cricket. I want to know you're living the life. I think you know that, but you yeah, checked you were with Stone. Yeah, Stone? yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Anybody, anybody, if, if it's some, if I was somewhere and somebody's talking about a DJ, mm-hmm. it's like not just I'm just looking for it. But if somebody's like, "Yo, such and such DJ in the night," I'm going. I'm going to see Chain Smokers. I'm going to see this person. I went to see Dead Mouse, right? Dead Mouse. So I, I you know, Dead Mouse. Is Someone crazy. with a mask. Dead, the Dead ma- Mouse is crazy. Like everybody's talking about Dead Mouse. He had residency at, at XS, line packed out. I'm like, I gotta go see this shit. Like, what is Dead Mouse doing? So I'm standing there watching Dead Mouse DJ, and I'm like, he don't even give a fuck <laughs> about nothing in the crowd. He's playing no records that have no words. He's the beat is like, <laughs> <laughs> and people are just looking and. They looking and I'm like, it's no DJ connection. He got a mask on. You don't, it's, you don't see no facial expressions. I was just like, damn, this shit is crazy. So I just be looking at it like, just trying to get ideas about what I'm gonna do, or just trying to figure out like what my next conversation is with somebody that's trying to book me. So I just check out everybody. The night he came to check me, Stone just kept texting me and telling me he's like, he wanted me to scratch in. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. yeah uh-huh. <laughs> That's all I already knew you was gonna say that. That's well, all he wants to do. Let's get, uh-huh. no, let's get mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's his whole thing. He wants to do that what all are, the time. What are the best ad libs in a song? I, they actually have that at the beginning of some at a bunch of they edits. Tapes. A yeah. bunch of they edits. Yeah. It says, you know, Stone Rock and Graham. Ah uh-huh, ha! And then uh-huh. it goes into the beat. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my god, these guys are crazy. <laughs> we we I just had we just had a discussion about you. Uh, I, we were talking about the best ad libs in in the game in the business. Oh, and, that was with Clint Sparks. With Clint Sparks, yeah. and we were saying like where it kind of stemmed from. I was saying, you know, initially I thought Pete Rock was yeah, one you, of the first. I, I saw that part. I think yeah. you probably. I mean, like I said, I I I only said that about Puff because I'm saying like what people keep trying to compete with me and Puff. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. T- I don't know. You know, everybody. I, I'm sure. Like Teddy Riley was talking on records before. I right. Yep, it. yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's not. I don't. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do with it. I'm talking about as far as doing it in the era that I feel like I'm part of. Mm-hmm. Right. In my era, you know, I was doing. Who else had a record out when Jump was out? Puff didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. Like this is this is. These are facts. facts. It's not me. I'm not trying to be. I'm saying you can look at the chart. Tell me who else from anybody from Atlanta, anybody else that's y'all that people claim is my competition or my peers, mm-hmm. who had a record out that was going head up with Jump. Who do you feel when Chris your, Cross was Who out? do you feel was your biggest competition? In Everybody. The Everybody. Yeah. But they got to be like one. Like uh, we were talking to Easy Mo B, and he was saying it was it was P Rock. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah, and my goal is to outdo everybody. I'm not thinking about, like, one person. I'm trying to outdo everybody because I'm looking at, like, like even, like, right now, we have these conversations about, well, I don't have these. So I be hearing people have these conversations about Jermaine Dupree writing and this, that, and the third, and people don't understand, like, 
Like, even when I said I, if I was an R&B artist, I'd be, you know, probably one of the, I have more songs than anybody, right? I think people thought I was saying that from a cocky perspective. And I'm just, and then when I see people say, well, it's a guy named Babyface out here, right? And I'm like, okay, what rap song did Babyface write? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Had had to be a, no. He never did. No. He never messed with rap. Yeah, he never, never did, did rap. R and B. I was gonna say the closest thing would have been the TLC record. Yeah, I was gonna say TLC. I would say Bobby Brown, but yeah, but he, didn't write, to, he didn't write. He didn't write nothing. Listen, you guys shit. are trying to make up shit. <laughs> I asked you a question. No, I said no. He's never written any rap. Music. I was blank. I was like, I never heard. So, so just say it. Yeah. No, <laughs> just say no. He has no. He's never written a rap song. He's never written a rap. All song. right. So, if you. Can't compare Babyface to Jermaine Dupree because I have written rap songs, number yeah. one, mm -hmm. and I've written R&B songs, yeah. number one. Yep. So you have to compare me to somebody that's in that space. You can't keep comparing me to people that's only on this one side of the track. We can't, I yeah. agree with you on that. I totally yeah. puff. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's definitely one of the things that makes you one of the greatest of all time in, in, this, in this music industry yep. is your ability to write, produce. But like I said, that's yeah. that's it's a... Uh, an idea that I had to like I want to b compete with everybody mm. I'm trying to compete with everybody I'm not trying to just compete with like rapping producers your, your early days of writing R&B was that with Escape pretty much no TLC TLC like, if you, I, I posted a video like I think a month ago with Left Eyes telling you, people and then t boss starts singing the song I made, I made this song called um I got it going on for TLC. And that was like the first time I started writing it. Well, I mean, I had been writing R&B records prior as a kid, but- I You mean, did want to write R&B records as a kid too. Yeah, I was just right. I mean, songs are songs to me. I don't, you know, if they have Well, melody. usually if you want to rap, you don't think like, oh, I want to be R&B. Yeah, I, I do. Don't want to do yes, I do. I write, wow. I write songs like rap records. Like they sound like raps to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I start translating them to the artist as songs. Like, yeah, you know, if you think about like every night I was in LA, I was with my ex girlfriend. Every time you called me, I said, "Girl, I'm I'm, I'm working." No, mm -hmm. I was out doing my dirt. I wasn't thinking about getting hurt. I was hand in hand in the Beverly Center, like right. man, not giving a damn who sees me. I'm rapping. Mm -hmm. Damn, Usher sounds like Usher. Yeah, <laughs> that's but, crazy. Uh, <laughs> Usher blew my fucking mind. <laughs> but it, but like I remember there was an interview. They were interviewing Escape, and they were like, "Oh man, like." Man, the toughest thing is listening to like JD's reference tracks. Yeah, because I'm rap, you, because I rap. I don't. I'm not singing it to them. But were you like trying to sing way, it? Were you trying to sing the melodies out? Yeah, they yeah. hear the melodies. Right. They hear the melodies, but they don't. It's not done in a way where they can copy something. Like a lot of songwriters and like R and B writers, they mm -hmm. they actually demo the records that actually sound like oh. It should be their song. That's almost like what my statement was about. If I was an R&B singer, mm -hmm. all of the records that don't get used, you guys would hear them because I can sing. But I don't consider myself an R&B <laughs> singer, <laughs> and I can't sing like that. So, therefore, you don't hear it, right? You don't get a chance to hear it the way that I present it to the artist. And the artists have to translate it in oh, their man. way. But, you know, they hear what I'm doing, oh, wow. and then they have to sing it the way that they would sing it as an artist. Oh, okay. But you are coming up with the melody, Everything. Right? I'm yeah, coming everything. up with all of it, but I'm saying you still have to push yourself as an artist. Like, I don't sound like Usher. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I just did it to you exactly how I did it on the beat, right? I'm in the Beverly Sun and that man, like, giving a damn who sees me. Uh-uh. And I'm doing it like that. So you hear the key, and then he takes it, and he does it the way Usher would do it. But are you, are you into, like, for example, your new record, your newest record with uh, Ari Lennox, Pressure. Mm -hmm. I love that record. I love that record. Um, when you're working with her, are you writing, are you writing, like, for example, are you in the booth and you're writing the, and you're kind of singing the humming the melody? Most of the songs, yeah. And most I of the mean, songs. I mean, that song, that song was just like, um, that was like one of the hardest records for me to make because it was dead in COVID. Right, it was like in the midst of COVID, everybody was in the studio with a mask on. I couldn't even see her facial expressions when I'm talking to her. Mm. Like I didn't even know if she liked what I was saying because we all had masks on. Nobody wouldn't take their mask off. I definitely wouldn't take my mask off. I wasn't getting sick of <laughs> shit. Right, so I'm in there making the beat. Everybody got a mask on. You, I could barely hear people talking because you they got the mask on. Mm -hmm. 
I just kept seeing all these girls on Instagram talking about this, that pressure, and I'm bad. I'm practicing that pressure, and this, that, and the third. And I'm like, oh, okay. I never really thought about it. When I got to the studio, I kept saying, oh, I got to find a break. I got to find a beat. So I started listening to samples. So I listened to samples, and I heard that record, and it sounded like it said pressure. They don't even actually say pressure, but it sounded like the sample mm -hmm. said pressure. And I was like, oh, this shit could be crazy. We could make an R&B record like Dipset, where you say something, I let the sample speak to you. Yeah, yeah. You say something, I let the sample speak to you. And like I said, I'm trying to tell her this with my mask on. So it's even harder. But I really, really totally understand what's going on. So I had to start saying like, da na 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 pressure. You know what I'm saying? I don't have the words, but I'm saying like this is what I'm saying. So we start laying the record out like that. It was kind of hard to make it though, but it made it. So that's that's how it works pretty much. You get the idea and the premise and then like the melody comes up and you Yeah, and if I have like, and if I got other writers in the studio, mm-hmm. Most of the time, I try to like lead them in the direction of what I'm hearing first, and the, the beat comes first, though, right? Yeah, always. It's funny because when I've seen you on like in on your IG and your Instagram, you're still using like the MPC. Yeah, still, use, still what using. What am supposed to do? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <to it. laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. That's a brand new machine. The MPC. Yeah, it's brand new. Which one are you? The using? one that you just seen. That it's, that it's brand new. It, I thought like, it was it's a brand new machine. <laughs> The, what, that shit the, like three thousand dollars. It's a brand new machine. Well, I thought you were using like what the MP3, what three thousand? I should be using my three thousand yeah. because it sounds better. But, really? But but that that X that you see me using all the mm -hmm. time on my videos, it's brand new, it's a brand new machine. Well, everyone because all the producers I know, like or the newer producers I know, they're just working on Ableton with keyboards and stuff. So yeah, they do a so, drop, drag and drop. Yeah, I'm yeah. making the beat. Yeah. It's a difference. Yeah, if you ever watch a, it's Living the Life <laughs> episode, he was still using floppy disk on some of these beats that he was making. I was like, damn, motherfucker, it's not like his whole oh, MPC course. room was yeah. just all floppy disk. Wait, wait, so wait, you don't you think there's a difference in the process of dragging and dropping and what you're doing on an MPC or with pads? I'm going to let you answer that question. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You I'm, I'm think is a difference. Like, well, you. Say, I think I there's mean, a drag difference. and drop means like this whole interview. It was just over there, and y'all just went and got it and pulled it into your computer and dropped it in here and said it's yours. That's what drag and drop is, mm -hmm. or like putting a like moving a little thing and like trying to figure out if that's where it goes. Like, that's not actually making the beat. I mean, people feel like it is. By the way, it's a new era of how people produce, and a right. lot of hit records come out this way. So I can't actually say it's not making a beat, but it's way different than actually creating, creating the beat. Interesting. Because the, 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 the actual grid is already there for you. I don't have no grid. I'm making a beat here. I have to find the time correct if I want the beat to swing. You have to do that yourself. So you're, you're still editing the samples, and you're cutting yeah, it up into yeah, MPC all, and everything. Everything. Wow. Yeah, and you, you don't. Know, if you don't do that, you're taking the fun out of being a producer to me. Really? Yeah. I've I've talked to a couple producers and I've told them about the MPC and they're like, no, you know, we all work in Ableton on the laptop and that's all we do. And then one of them switched over and they said, oh my god, I'm having so much more fun. And I'm tapping in. I'm I'm like tapping into different like creative spaces that I haven't done by using like an MPC or like a like literally a manual pads. Yeah, it's because it's because you know. Um, the MPC doesn't give you information for mistakes, and it doesn't give you information for um, for people that's challenged, right? So if you get into a space in the MPC and you don't know what to do, naturally, us guys that's been on these MPs, mm -hmm. we figure it out ourselves, right? So like for so long, I had an MP, and... If you sample on the MP, you had to save it first before you had before you could sample, right? I would make beats for two, three, four hours. Let the drum machine run. I'm trying to rap, da da da. And I get an idea. And I'm like, I should sample this part. And I forget that the drum machine, if I do not save it, the entire track is be erased once I sample. And I go sample and go back and hit play, and the whole beat be gone, right? I did this for months, years. 
once you start getting into that process of that big mess up, you start learning all of these little parts without ever reading the manual. You just learn shit like, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that. And and by the way, you coming up, you won't have no conversation with Roland or any of these people to tell them they should fix this. Now I'm talking to the guy Andy at NPC and talking to him and telling him about stuff I don't After like. After all these years? Yeah, prior to that, no. Really? Yeah. That's, that's insane. No. Nah. So whenever you're starting a beat, you're starting at the MPC, kind yeah. of, yeah. I'm Not starting. Even at, I'm, I actually start on the turntables a lot of times. I be just like, yeah, you wow. know, because I hear beats. I make a lot of my beats based on mixes. Wait, wait. Can you elaborate? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean on mixes? <laughs> um, so if I'm mixing two records together, and I hear how the drum beats sound mixing together, so if I hear kick doubling up on this record. While it's mixing with this record, mm. I go and try to make that beat. Oh, wow. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah, because nobody else is going to hear it so besides the DJ or me or somebody else that does that. So are you testing blends out and mixes out and seeing and drums and everything on turntables first and then you're kind of going? I mean, I just, it's just a natural thing. Natural thing that I just happens. be sitting there like if I make a beat. Yeah. Right. If I make a beat, my turntables are sitting right beside of it. Right. So I might play a break while I'm listening to the beat that I just made. Wow. Right. So if that's happening, I hear something that happens between the beat and the record. And then I add a, oh, this kick is going off on this, this record right here. So maybe I should take the sound of this kick and add it to this. Right. So if you listen to like um, grills, right. Mm -hmm. If you listen to the boom. It's a it's a little kick that's in there that's small, that that's in between the the eight oh eight, and um, and the way it sounds is really it's really little. It don't have no definition or nothing. It just adds this little boom, 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 boom like in between it. Um, that happened because I was listening to two records, oh, wow. and that kick was playing off of the other kick, and I'm like, I'm gonna put this in here, and it just adds like kind of like. A little bit of an extra, like mid sound. Well, add a, kick, it adds right? a bounce to the a record bounce. that you don't actually hear when you hear the beat by itself without it. Interesting. Oh. Wow. You're gonna get a lot of DJ producers <laughs> on the NPC <laughs> after this after I this mean, interview. I, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, but it, but it, it's only because you, like, if you're into it, like, I'd be in the room with my MP for hours. Like, you gotta be into like just like sitting there and listening to a beat over. And over and over and again until you find what you believe it is. Wow. To this day, you're still spending hours and just fucking with the NPC. Yeah. Well, what else Amazing. is there to do? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, what else is there to do? I don't, I don't have no fun doing nothing else besides, you know, I play video games. But other than that, that's it. So you still, you still enjoy making music after all these years? Yeah, because nobody else is doing it. Like I said, I still look at who else is, who's my competition? You know, like when, in, in real life, right, when everybody be talking about, like, Dre and they talk about these guys, they are amazing producers to me. I don't knock any of them, mm -hmm. but they don't do what I do. I'll go write a whole song for Usher, then I'll go write a whole song for somebody rap, right? Like, you just said Pressure was my, new, first, my newest record, mm -hmm. but I got records on this kid, Young Dylan, that's way newer than this, mm -hmm. right? That's out right now, right? You know what I'm saying? So it's like... And a lot of these records, people don't be paying attention to because, like I said, they're in such of a different genre. Like, Young Dylan's 13, and he's on Nickelodeon. So you guys probably not even paying no attention to it. That's why when I said about the relevant thing, how can somebody be more relevant than me? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm in a space that nobody ain't even paying no attention to. Yeah, yeah. Right? Relevant I'm, I'm really in that space of an older person space talking about relevance, that's them talking about that. They're not relevant over here. Yeah, I'm watching music videos in the bodega, so. Yeah. You, know, you can't talk. <laughs> you, can't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just like, it's just, it's just, it's just that. It's like you can't really, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making records in a space where a lot of people don't go. And I don't have a problem with starting over. That's the thing about me. Like, I just, I got a brand new record coming out I'm going to leave it with y'all. Um, um, yeah, please. Jacquees. Oh, so it bro. drops on the 5th. I'm going to leave it with y'all now so y'all can have it. You can DJ whenever you play it. We'll, um, end, we'll end the episode with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, we got a new record coming out, me and Jacquees. And I'm doing a whole album with artists that I've never worked with. So it'll be like an R&B record with 
a uh, bunch of different rappers. It's like and a, it's, and a it's, compilation? On, it's on Mass Appeal. So, uh, like, the last one that Mass Appeal did was, I think, the, the Swiss Beach Project, right? So, I have the next one, but mine is more R&B and hip hop. Oh, wow. And the first single is me and Jack. Wait, Quincy. when is that? The whole project, when is it releasing? I gotta album. finish it, I don't know. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the first single is dropping on, on the 5th. Wow. August, August 5th. That sounds exciting. That's crazy yeah, that man. he still has to work a record like the old times, and it's just not like just drop a whole project the next week. It's like he still wants to work a fucking. Oh song. yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that. Like I'm trying to give my record to the DJs. I don't know what that is. Like drop a record. Like what does that mean? Like yeah, like just what happens when you do that? Well, yeah, it flops within two weeks and shit. It doesn't really last. See, long. that's what I'm saying. That's why you guys podcast should be more popular and be bigger because artists should hear this from you guys. They should hear that that shit don't work because they think that works. They think that dropping a project, you guys are going to the computer and pulling it up and putting it into your Serato. You're not doing that if you're from an era where people actually hand you music. Yeah, because even like the, the new Travis Scott, like I had it, it take me like three listens to really get into it. And even then I'm like, what the fuck can we play off of this shit? There was no, I mean, the the single was a K-pop that came out like two weeks ago, but there was no work for that. They, 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 he didn't work the sound. He didn't work. He just like, let me put Bad Bunny and Weekend and myself and see if it fucking goes. So that's that's the problem. It, that's what I'm saying. This is why you guys' podcast needs to become more popular because artists, they need to hear what you guys are talking about because they're not getting that perspective. They just believe that names and drop is is something that people chase yeah mm -hmm. and me i'm going to magic city every week Still. giving the dj my record <laughs> By the oh, way, giving the wow. dj the record yeah <laughs> yeah. I, yeah i gave my all, last week i was in magic city two nights for two nights straight to five in the morning what, what's the sound that you're hearing in, in magic city right now do you, do you hear like when you're there and you're seeing the energy and everything um, I mean, you know, most of the records that, by the way, me being in Magic City mm -hmm. this past week was the determination of what my my DJ list was for coming here, because these are the records that I heard in Magic City. I'm like, oh, okay, we got to download this, we got to download this, got to download this. I'm saying, like, people have this feeling about the Gunner record, and I'm like, Shh, they playing that shit to death in Magic Big. City. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, as a DJ, I can't. If if I'm gonna be a DJ, you gotta be a part of what's happening. You can't yeah. play around with what's going on. That fuck you mean record yeah. is big right it's now. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's big. Yeah. So yeah. you know what I mean. So being in the club determined what my playlist was. So I'm like, okay, I need to add these songs to my Serato. It's it's so like refreshing to see a producer and a writer and 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 you know just an individual in the music industry at your status be still be so diligent. And have this humility to just like really just keep their ear to the streets and like continually talk, gather information. Do you know, like there's almost like very little ego when it I comes mean, well, to my you, company's you know? called So So Deaf. It's called like I made that name because this person was deaf and I felt like I was so much better than that person. <laughs> So that's why <laughs> it's called so so deaf. You're not so, so as, deaf. You're as, so so yeah, deaf. Yeah. So so if you have that mentality that you better than people or you want to be better than people, that's the only way you're gonna live. You're gonna try to keep trying to figure out what it is that you can do to better yourself than what the next person is. Mm. That's how I move. There's a DJ in LA. His name's uh, Artistic, mm. and um, he he's kind of he's actually a really great DJ. Yeah, JD, I think you would love him if you heard him on Twitter. He compiled a, a list of the top. 190s R&B songs, mm -hmm. and, but it was what was so interesting about it. This is the top 50 right here. Yeah. So what was so interesting about this list was it was really a list of young people who didn't grow up during the 90s, but they were kind of listing their favorite 100 songs from the 90s. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was so interesting because their top, you know, even if you just look at the top 10. Seeing that from a perspective of someone who grew up in the 90s and was listening to the music in the 90s, they would never vote for some of those songs in the top 10. Um, but some of them, some of them definitely are, you know, are worthy of being there. But I just kind of wanted to just <laughs> get your opinion on this list and how it was. Well, I mean, I can't, you know, I, I feel like you can't, you, know, you can't go off of like, what is, what is, what is, what is he saying about this list that makes it a list? Well, the thing is like everyone voted on Twitter. Oh, okay. So like through the votes, yeah. everyone voting on Twitter, this I, was, this is kind of like a 20 year old's 
version of what the top hundred songs. And these are records. By, by the way, these are records that resonate now. It's now not, more, yes, more exactly. now yeah, than it's ever. Not, yeah. It's not a list that resonates like in the time when it was made. Right. This mm-hmm. is more of a like Tevin Campbell would definitely never be at the top right. of the list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> time when it happened, Tevin Campbell's record is. Probably one of the number one records in all of R and B parties of today. Yeah, yeah. that's today. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, I can't really. This is a, a list for today. Right. I can't really speak on it because it's probably accurate on um, based on what is happening in the clubs when people are doing these R and B parties today. Yeah. So when you see this, you're just completely like, this would never. Well, so I, my question was this: In your, do you have a top five or top ten from the '90s, the top '90s R and B songs? No. Nah. No. 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 Um, nah. <laughs> nah. I mean, because I don't actually, you know, it's crazy because I don't, I be, I be trying to figure out like, nah. Because <laughs> nah. I mean, in the 90s for me, this this list is like R&B too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are you talking about R&B list? R&B. Yeah, I wasn't into R&B music in the 90s. But you, <laughs> what? <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> like, I, I say this because I'm laughing no. because I was you know I was I'm with Daniel from Drew Hill I mean from a uh, division all the time right yeah and I told him the same thing like I I'm I'm, I'm I come from hip hop I don't come from R and B I was a kid I was a break dancer I grew up wanting to DJ rap do graffiti and break dance if you came up in the era that I came up in you didn't even like R and B music. R and B artist was whack to you. It was like for the older, yeah, for the, for un- older, the older people, brothers and sisters, and it aunties. wasn't something yeah. that we was like gravitating to. So sure. I wasn't even gravitating to R and B music. So that's what I'm saying. When you listen to my R and B songs, they're written like rap records. They're written as rap records. Um, when I did my my way for Usher, mm-hmm. this is the first time I ever worked with an R and B artist male. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. And I had no kind of way to follow prior to me getting to that space. So when you were working with Escape, you were just really writing all those songs like from a hip hop writer. Yeah, so like even if you listen to Escape, right? Some of the people that be talking about Escape, like if you listen to Escape song, just kicking, it's written from a male's perspective. It says every man wants a woman. That's not how women talk. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but people don't. I don't think people. I mean, I heard people talk about that, and they'd be like, "Why would? Why would the lyrics say that? Why would? Why would they start a song that says every man wants a woman, that him and her can go just go hang a woman?" He, it, it, the whole song was written from my perspective of what a man wants. So, like, it's it's just unorthodox of like what R&B records were prior to that. I mean, you made some really good R&B records. Fucking yeah, song of the decade. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying, it's just, my writing style is just a different, the way I go about making songs is So you're different. telling me you can't give me a top five because you didn't listen to R&B in the Not 90s? Not like that. Really? I mean, you know, I'm a, because I'm a Teddy Riley junkie. Uh-huh. My top five probably would have been like, you know, Let's Chill, mm. Goodbye. Teddy, I, I'm sure, um, you know, my prerogative, <laughs> Teddy Riley, heavy, like super heavy Teddy Riley. Um, Roni, these, like Bobby Brown, these records in that era was like. It's like the R&B we, we listened to during our era was like New Jack Swing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and Teddy Riley was like, you know, Teddy Riley is a god to me, right? So, it's right. like, I'm sure my top five is Teddy Riley records. <laughs> Easily. Top five is all Teddy Riley. You know, like, yeah. let's make make it last forever. Right. Like, it's probably all Teddy Riley. That's what I'm saying. He had Make It Last Forever. He had, um, there's a right and a wrong. The whole Keith Sweat album. The first album. The whole first Keith Sweat album is all Teddy Riley. Yeah. Right? And then if you add these guy songs, it's, you know, I can't have a top five because I'm already past that. But it would, all be, it would be all Teddy Riley for me. It wouldn't be none of these songs. Would you ever DJ like one of these, like, you know, day parties, these R&B day parties? Would you ever want to do that? Um, I do it. I I've, I've been doing it, but I don't do I don't like I said I don't do R and B. I just be doing I be do, I, I mix it in, but I do more hip hop. Like, well, they I, they kind of mix everything in, but they, yeah, they yeah. but then you could just drop like you know Escape Understanding out of nowhere. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I you, did you know? that. I did that. Yeah. What 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 was we we came here? Uh, that was Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. So Cinco de Mayo weekend, mm-hmm. I did the R and B block party. So they had the R and B block party that was at um what was it, Aria. 
There was an R and B block party. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an R and B block party that goes around the country, right? And it's made up by um, family from that's Pharrell's homeboy, mm. right? And they have this thing called the R and B block party where they actually do these basic shows. And all they play is R&B music. And I was the headline DJ for that weekend. Um, and um, it, was, it was crazy because it was like, I'm going to show people that I could DJ a whole hour, a full hour, and play nothing but the ballads that I made. No up-tempos. I played nothing but the ballads that I wrote. I think that would be amazing. Fuck. I did it. And people, I think you people was back there like, yo, what? Wait, wait a minute. And I'm saying I'm not gonna play nobody else's records. Yeah. I'm only gonna play my ballads. Not up tempo, not uh, nothing else. I'm only gonna play the ballads. You're gonna play all the ballads. And I mean, I mean, you know, more s- slower tempo. I mean, I played pressure, of course. But mm-hmm. if it's more down tempo, I played all the records that was in that space. So you can see the tone would be like that for a whole hour. Wow. I feel like yeah. you should take that on the road. I would love to hear that. Oh no, we supposed to do yeah. it. They got Lollapalooza. We supposed to do it. I think they got it got canceled. But this group of guys that do this, they yeah, have. Yeah. A, it's called the R and B Block Party. They take. It's like a you know a DJ um, festival thing. Oh man. Yeah, but they doing all R and B music. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would. I would pay to see that shit. Dude, yeah, I would pay absolutely. See, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just had it here in Vegas. You know, we didn't know anything that's about it. That. That. That's, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what, that's, that's, by the way, that's why this is one of the reasons why I came here. I came here because I feel like you guys, not that I can make it that much bigger, but I'm saying I feel like you guys in this podcast need to, it's more important to be heard, right? And people should start connecting these dots more and understand how much, you know, how much the information that we're talking about really really matters to what people are out there doing hmm. yeah well, i mean we I, we appreciate that for yeah. real we yeah. appreciate your time here man yeah. I mean, sure. this All is right. like uh we've talked about you so much we were just talking with lathan we, we talk about you so much throughout all our episodes uh-oh so this yeah. was uh, <laughs> no, in a good way in a good way no no in a great way yeah yeah <laughs> he's like uh what <laughs> no no like and you know it just meant like uh, for us, this is like for real. It's like a surreal moment to have you on. Yeah. So, but we appreciate it, man. No, I appreciate real. it for sure. Bef- before we leave, I, I I gotta know. You said you play video games. You game and shit. Yeah. What What do you play? I mean, two K. Two K. Yeah, two K for hours. Oh shit. Okay. And Mortal Kombat for hours. Mortal Kombat. Yeah. The new one, right? That's just yeah. Dope. Wow. Yeah. So you don't do Warzone? You don't do that? No, I don't like um shooter games. Being the person game. Oh, one oh, person game. Yeah, I don't, like, person. Oh, okay, I don't okay. like being first person game. I want to. I will actually see the guy that I'm moving around. Okay. Pause. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <but> yeah. <laughs> All right, JD. I have one yeah, more question. Um, are you interested in doing any parties from like DJs that they build up, like the R&B and Ribs, which is the R&B party up in the Bay Area, or even here, like a, a Sim City and stuff? Like, you interested in doing those type of things, or always? I mean, most, majority. I you know. I'm expensive, so a lot of times that's why I don't. It's a, it's a budget issue. I don't, budget yeah, issue. a lot of times it just doesn't happen because I'm more expensive than what the, the promoters want to pay. Um, but I mean, you know, if, if they find the money, I'm there. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> you gotta have the budget first. Yeah, hey, you got I mean, because I don't. I, I think a lot of times these guys they don't they take if not DJs but promoters they just think about DJs right. And to be honest, it's DJs in Atlanta that's so underpaid. Like they're doing six hours for two hundred and fifty dollars, three fifty. Six hours for three fifty? No fucking way. That's like, in a lot of places, like, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it happens out here in Vegas. <laughs> also. It happens in Vegas yeah. too. This, I'm saying this. Is what I'm saying. That's what I'm telling you. The promoters, you should, we should go on strike. Like the writers, but the writers? Like, <laughs> for real, like the, the DJ don't come to the party. What the fuck y'all gonna do then? You know what I'm saying? Like for real, it's not. It don't make no sense because the DJ means so much to parties. The DJ means so much to the vibe. It should be taken a little bit more seriously than what it is. So me. In the process of doing this DJing thing, I was doing DJing for like whatever would happen, right? Because I wanted DJ so bad. But then I also started watching, like, say for instance, like Tris. I was talking to uh, Lathan about Tris. I'm, I made that club pop. I don't care what nobody said. Like, <laughs> what no other DJs making that club jump like that? Because we would be here on Friday night. So the night before I would DJ on Saturday, I'd go to Tris. You know what I mean? Like, we'd go to the club to see if anybody else was in there. Mm-hmm. And the traffic that was coming into that club 
on the nights that I was DJing was mm -hmm. completely different than anybody else that was in there. Yeah. Right. So so when you start seeing that and you see what what you're bringing to the environment, you got to make the promoters understand that they got to pay for it. And if they don't, they really got to pay for it. It's going to be a weird time, though, with AI coming out. No. Uh, you know, no. Yeah. How? You I know, think AI, I, AI DJ? I think it's going to happen a little nah. bit, a little bit more. Uh, where? In, but in, like, in like smaller venues. I think like smaller, smaller like lounges, bars, well, clubs. I think well, what part happen. of it are you talking about? Like what are you talking about? Just people just playing music and it just be an AI DJ? I think AI is just going to know and figure out what songs, what to play, where to play, where to when, play when certain to play, songs. Yeah. Nah. And then, um, and w at what times, and what's what's a, what's more effective? And I they, think that'd be hard. And they're already hard. they're already knowing how to like blend it and mix but it. But it doesn't and everything. stay though. You you know uh, for, that for smaller. You know that as a DJ, you can't if you hit the sync button. That shit don't stay there. <laughs> <laughs> it, drifts, it drifts away. It's I not think, gonna happen. I think on a happen. smaller lounge That's bar level, happen. I think yeah, I don't because I you tickle. know you know why I say it's not gonna yeah. happen because the way it was created, it wasn't created for something. C computer to do it like DJing actually takes you understanding even like me like I come from turntables mm -hmm. and I'd be watching myself like tap the, the speed wheel on the, the CDJ, CDJ right <laughs> yeah. to try to keep it and the shit don't it don't it don't it does not do it the way turntables turn turn do it, do it. Mm -hmm. like you actually I can't even say it because it's a pause but you actually <laughs> you saying the squeeze <laughs> The squeeze on the knob. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Pause. Yeah. Uh, and just to spin, just to slow the record down, right? You you doing that, you can slow the record down without actually even touching the vinyl. Mm -hmm. And it's just yeah. a thing that just happens naturally, right? And, it, and if you're mixing, right? If you're actually mixing records, these are things that just, they just are just like, like women having babies. Like when you DJ, you just know that this is what it is. You don't have to have nobody tell you what to do. You just know that this is how you DJ and this is how you slow records down in order to go into other things. Mm -hmm. I don't believe you're gonna if so if you have AI doing it, you just it's not gonna be authentic like that. I don't think it will, but I think it'll be just good enough. Nah. Just for, for, don't say and, and that. Just I, I feel, it. Don't say that. I feel like this is the way the world works, is that everybody if like oh, yeah, right we now, are in that, we are in a space where people don't care where it's just just good enough to we, get by. This yeah. is the most just good enough oh, yeah, yeah. era gotta, in the whole we world. Gotta change that. Like everything is just yeah, good yeah, enough. We yeah. gotta, we gotta you know change, what I'm saying? We yeah. gotta change that though. We can't just be just good enough. <laughs> of course, but I Because it, by the way, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna hurt. The same way that that message came out a month ago about hip hop. Mm. Like people saw that and was like, oh, Oh shit Like Oh Ain't been no number one Hip hop records This whole year Ain't been no number one Hip hop record Period mm -hmm. In the whole year 2023 Till we get to August That's a That's a huge statement If you had people out here Saying hip hop Was the number one genre Blah 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 Nah Then you go almost A whole year With no number one record That 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 was a mindset That made people be like Oh shit Like Travis you gotta hurry up And come out with an album well, How did you feel When you heard that I'm not surprised because, like, we're in that era that you just said. Right. It's just good enough. Everybody's just just good enough. Just good enough doesn't pay the bills. Right? That's why you see yeah. tour. I'm telling you, that's why tours, people, all these big artists, they tours ain't working because they just trying to be just good enough. You got to push past just good enough. You got to come back to, because, like, like you said, you just showed me a list of young kids mm -hmm. that are listening to records that weren't just good enough. So they, their taste buds are starting to like stuff that was, like, amazing. Like, Tevin Campbell's record, Can We Talk, that's an amazing song. It's an amazing record. Right? So if, if a 20-year-old kid put that song at the top of his list, when he listens to this shit that's coming out now, he don't give a fuck about that. <laughs> if that's the record that's at the top of his list. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. people got to start understanding that. If these kids keep going back and listening to the same thing with me. When I was a kid, I start, I'm, I'm, I'm. Gathering all the information about hip hop, right? So I don't care nothing about nothing else that's not authentic. If it's not the authentic thing, if, if it's not Shirt Kings making my t shirts and putting the airbrush, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. If it ain't, you know what I mean? If it ain't come from Dapper Dan, I don't want it. If it's not, if it's not hip hop that I feel like is certified, then I don't want to have nothing to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. If they keep letting kids download information of old shit that's way better than the shit that's happening right now, their taste buds are going to be what my taste buds were, pause, and then 
they're not gonna <laughs> like nothing that's coming out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like for real. So that's that's the part that's dangerous because that's what's happening. People keep thinking that's a thing. Like if you ride around in a Maybach for a month, you're never gonna want to get in a Toyota. It's never gonna happen. <laughs> a Toyota come pick you up, you're gonna be mad as fuck. Somebody sent you a Toyota, you can ride around on a Maybach. You're not gonna even wanna get in that shit, right? That's what's gonna happen if you keep letting them download this amazing music and making lists and talking about it and listening to Aaliyah and all these artists. They're gonna start saying, like, this is trash. This is the shit I wanna hear. Who gonna make this, right? And the closest people that make what that is, that's what the generation is gonna start flocking to. Are you slightly curious about dabbling or fucking with AI at all for no. production? Not at all. I don't like anything fake. Mm. Right? So I don't I don't I don't I don't think it's cool to be able to say that you have a record with Biggie. Mm. Right? I don't I don't understand that cuz that like I think the 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 excitement of you being able to say that you work with Biggie Smalls is a jewel that you can have only if mm. you did it. Just like when y'all asked me about working with Tupac. I didn't. That's something that didn't happen in my life, and I got to deal with that. I'm not going to make a fake Tupac song say I made a record with Tupac. It's going to be fake. Like, that's not cool, right? And and I feel like the world ain't made for everybody. Like, people got to stop doing that, right? When we talk about R&B and we talk about hip-hop, these are two separate genres, right? And for some reason, when a conversation happened, it's R&B. All these rap motherfuckers trying to talk about what they would, what was, you don't have nothing to do with R&B. Like, stay over here where the fuck you at. Ain't no need for you to even be talking about R&B. And the same thing for hip hop. If it's a hip hop conversation, nobody from R&B should be over in there unless you actually are making both. If you're not making both, then you're, you don't really know what you can, you don't have no real say in the dominance of what's happening on both sides. That's just how I feel. And I know people going to have a lot to say about that, what I'm saying right now, but it's the truth. What are, what are you talking about specifically, though? About I'm just saying, like, stuff? if I make R&B records, yeah. nobody, could, somebody, nobody from hip-hop understand. Like, if you're a real hip-hop person, mm. right, how could you tell me about my R&B record? But where, where, where was that happening? No, I'm just saying that's what's oh, okay, happening, okay. period. That's what you see every day on the internet, right? You see... All you see on the internet is everybody chiming in mm-hmm. on everything. Yeah, right? Yeah. right? A top list. Yeah, like, y- how can everybody chime in on everything? Everybody's not capable of doing everything. Mm-hmm. Like, just like you talking about gaming, right? If you just have gaming and somebody plays um, Call of Duty, yeah, and all they play is, and I, all I play is NBA 2K, I can't have a conversation about Call of Duty. But... People that just because they play games, they still want to get in the conversation. You have no right to get in the conversation. You yeah. don't even know what's going on. The, the when the pro- dude go around the door and he pull out the gun and da 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 da, you don't know what's happening, <laughs> right? And what type of gun you're supposed to use and all of this. I'm here. I be here. My I know J- JD. I feel like you should start fucking with K- nah, Call listen, of Duty. Hearing, you know what you're talking about, right? I now. hear yeah, my yeah. homeboys talking about it. <laughs> listen, they be telling me like JD, you be up so late, you should get on Call of Duty. Yeah, I'm should. like, fuck no, I'm playing basketball. <laughs> I'm beating somebody ass in Japan right now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I would love to play Call of Duty. Yeah, yeah nah, I'm I'll play Warzone with you one day. Nah, I'm not with it. <laughs> <laughs> I just seen Nicki Minaj is on Call of Duty now. So. Really? Yeah, she's a oh, character. She's got a character yeah. on this. Oh, oh. <laughs> have you thought of uh, doing Twitch and all that shit? Because I know you were big on the vlogs back in there. By the way, you probably were the first. Don't like, do that. Don't do that. We don't. We don't want the more, more, no, no more arguments about me being the first. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were early on vlogging, like way 2007, 2008, before a lot of people were doing vlogging. Yeah. And I love that because you would show like making a beat, all the behind the scenes stuff, even uh, Dondra's career. Like that was pretty sick. Yeah. But like you never thought about doing that again for even like gaming or anything like that. Nah. I mean, I did the first one. That, I just did my first like, um, I guess. Um, beat making um, Well not beat making But talking about equipment Yeah And I just did one Where I'm actually like Talking to The people about The, the drum machine and Production the, No no The actual function, the Functionality of the drum machine uh, Tutorial So that's what they call it On, 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 on uh, YouTube uh, So I basically just did My first Drum machine tutorial about me finding a space of trying to record into the drum machine, just like a whole thing. And it was my first one. And, you know, pe- I was watching people respond to it, and they was like, oh, shit, 
this uh, our our life is over if people like Jermaine Dupri starts making tutorials. <laughs> so I was like, oh shit, I'm like, I ain't gonna keep doing this because they they gonna feel like I'm taking over their space or something. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, I do it just out of fun, but it's not something I'm really like, gonna do. Because I missed the living the life episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, living the life was crazy because I was carrying a camera and I and and by the way, I I didn't know. I got I got burnt out with living a life because I felt like people didn't understand how much access I was giving people to see. It was a lot. And nobody responded to it. Like nobody was giving me no podcast money. Nobody wasn't coming to me no. saying nothing. You were too early in the it game. Was, yeah, that was it was early. too early. Yeah, but that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's why I keep telling y'all about the relevance thing. Like it's like if I'm too early, how am I not relevant? It's just, that's the whole definition of relevance. It's like mm-hmm. you have to be the start of things, right? So that's what I'm saying. When I'm that hurt early and don't nobody respond, then I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck it. I guess I, I guess that's not it. Because you kind of made even your own Reddit <laughs> with Global 14. Like yeah. That was a discussion board and it was all this shit. Well, I made my own threads. That's yeah, what threads. Global 14 was basically what threads is right now. So it's crazy when I was watching. I'm like looking at threads coming. I'm like, damn, I had this already. Like I signed... 80,000 people to my own yeah. social network, right? That that actually actually signed up to my own social network. And I made a profile. Writing, <laughs> and they was writing their own messages on my own, my own social network. Yeah, you would have like discussions and like questions of the day or whatever the fuck yeah, it was. Yeah, I did all that. But, but like I said, as I'm sitting there and nobody responding, like I was looking for, you know, seed money and all of this type of shit at that time but nobody was coming they was acting like what I was doing wasn't even like real so I just got I get to a point where I'm like okay on to the next thing let me figure out something else to do that's how we feel when we get like a record that we really love we try to push it in the club and it doesn't doesn't work work. Mm -hmm. and then we just like all right, well but why don't it work it just doesn't work some of these newer records oh well that means it's not good then and then six months later it'll just become huge yeah Oh. and then I'll just be like I don't want to even fucking play this record now (laughs) Uh because I was giving it a chance earlier Mm -hmm. but you like I think the one thing I'm going to say for DJs if y'all doing that y'all should make sure that y'all like put something out to make sure that the, the artists know that you guys are trying to break records because I feel like that used to happen like when people used to make dub plates and the DJ used to ask for an artist to put their name in the record or this mm-hmm. that and the third mm-hmm. um, I don't really hear none of that happening no more Yeah, and all of that stuff well remixes in itself like, like the remixes of just reworking the beat and doing what you guys did in the 90s and 2000s yeah like that would be amazing now if yeah they would, but if they I, just did it. that's what I'm saying I think you guys have to speak up more and let let these people know Look at him, he's like, fuck you, that shit. You, you know what? <laughs> I will say, I don't know who the person is in Beyonce's team, but her, whoever was behind Renaissance, the genius thing they did was they, they um, provided instrumentals and acapellas in her release for that album. Well, her, 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 her project um, um, is, is, is a DJ-driven type of project. Right. It's a dance mm-hmm. project, right? Mm-hmm. So the number one person inside a dance party is the DJ, mm-hmm. right? So so you can't forget about the DJ if that's the that's what you're pushing. But that's the first acknowledgement I've seen from an artist when they're releasing their music to provide instrumentals and acapellas in a long time. Because if you look at hip hop, it's been I don't know over five or eight years since we've seen an instrumental or acapella. Do y'all have threads? Like threads? Does this podcast have threads? Yeah. Okay, you should make sure that you start putting that type of shit up there and make people talk about it. I never seen it, but y'all should start putting things that y'all feel like artists should do for DJs and just start. I'll definitely chime in and make motherfuckers start talking about it. <laughs> so that they, I'm telling you, it's because that that's what needs to happen. It don't need to be like a whole like it's this stuff is real. This ain't like no like like I said. I only came here because I didn't want to talk about gossip. I don't care about none of that other shit. I make music, and that's what's why I do. Um, and everybody know that I make records I DJ I do what I'm That's it You want to talk about gospel I ain't got time to do that That don't do nothing for me It don't pay no bills Let's talk about what I actually do mm-hmm. Right So I'm saying You guys It's a serious thing This is life Right You've been DJing For your whole life Right So I feel like More content Towards what you're talking about Yeah It just drives More people being better And it's the education That people need Can you make us a promise That 
and all the records that you release moving forward, you're going to provide instrumentals and acapellas for us? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's not nothing. Yeah. Well, I just told you I'm about to give you a record. That ain't even out yet. What are you talking about? <laughs> but moving fact, forward. I'm about, to, I'm about to send you that song right now while people, so people can see me. All right. I need y'all to play it before the fifth, though, by the way. So whoever DJing at one of these pool parties is coming. We're, me and Never working tonight, right after this. So. Oh, well, then you got to yeah. play it tonight. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Take a video and send it to me. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Hey JD, thank you so much for coming through. For sure, yeah. it's uh, like, look, it means a lot to us, man. Shout out to you, your whole team, mm-hmm. Lathan. Thank you so much. Shout out to P Dot, Yanni, all everybody, man. We really appreciate it. Yeah, man. all thank right, you. for sure. Yo, JD in the building. Thank you. All right. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace.